30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Okay, members, welcome to a meeting of the Justice Committee and if you can do the needful with any electronic devices, if there's any declaration of interest for business from today's proceedings, now is the time to declare it. And if you're content, um, the evidence sessions will be recorded by Hansard as well. Members are agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Um, Linda, you'd ask just to address the committee at the start of the proceedings. I'm happy to hand over to yourself at this stage. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. It's in relation to a remark that was made by myself last week in the committee. I have already pub apologised publicly in relation to um, the use of the word coloured rather than black. I was speaking to Section 75 groups and I just wanted to put it on the record in committee, given that it was in committee that I use the word and just again to place on record that I am genuinely and sincerely sorry for the hurt that was caused and any anxiety that was caused to and any offence that was caused to, to anybody. It was not my intention but irrelevant of the intention. That is what happened so I apologise unreservedly. Thank you for that and certainly at the time I, I didn't uh, sense any malice in terms of what had been said whatsoever um, last week, but I've taken the opportunity to, to put it onto the record and we're content we'll leave it at that at this stage. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there any, we have apologies from Doug Beattie. Um, and then Sinead is joining us through the Starleaf facility. So item two then is the draft minutes of the meeting that were held on the 12th of November. If members are content that the minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings of the meeting held on the 12th of November, uh, then I will sign them. If you're agreed, agreed. Matters arising. There's two items uh, just to consider the matters arising. The first one, there's a letter from the Minister outlining her updated position in relation to the amendments prior to the consideration stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, which was provided to members Monday. Uh, the Minister had indicated in her letter that she hoped to share some of her draft amendments for further consideration stage and these have now been received from the Department and are on pages 3 to 14 of the tabled pack. Uh, the cover guidance on data collection, operation and compass, uh, reporting and independent oversight on the operation of part 1, training and eligibility to civil legal aid. Um, and she will provide a proposed amendment in relation to the interim protection for victims uh, for victims' provision as soon as possible. Members, we know that we have agreed to schedule consideration of any, any amendments for our meeting next week, uh, where officials will be attending um, to provide any further information or clarification uh, that uh, is required. Uh, but I thought it would be helpful at this stage just to have a preliminary discussion with members on the proposed amendments and any other issues that the committee may wish to take forward in light of the consideration stage uh, that has now passed in the Assembly prior to officials attending the meeting next week um, in order that we can have more focused questions and get clarity where some of the issues are. So for ease of reference, the text of the committee amendments and the amendments that were made by Rachel Woods in relation to civil legal aid, they can be found on page 12. Did I look it up myself? Page 12 of your uh, tabled pack. So I know we got these yesterday uh, in terms of some of the further consideration amendments that the Minister wishes to, to consider um, and in advance of next week um, I've asked the committee staff just to, to look at them as well as what we brought forward to make sure that it's in keeping with that um, and members will obviously get an opportunity to, to look at it themselves but in advance of next week um, if there's any issues that members want to raise now that we can do a bit of preparatory work for that, then um, now will be an opportunity to do that. I know, in, I know that in respect of the legal aid amendment um, during the debate, I had indicated um, you know, a willingness to see if there would be even more that we can do, um, and I'm keen to, to identify is there further opportunity. Um, and so I'm going to ask the bill clerk to come back um, next week as well. Um, but I had outlined some of the areas where I would like to see more um, 
inclusion of a broader issue for victims of domestic abuse, but obviously this bill um, may, may constrain us um, in terms of the, the broader piece of work uh, that I would like to see. The Minister outlined you know, some of her reasons for opposing the amendment around uh, costs still remaining and, and so on, and this amendment has been brought forward by the Minister, which I'm sure we'll, we'll touch upon. Um, and it may be that we need to, to see if we can provide an amendment to make sure that actually these costs um, aren't applied, um, and that's something that I'd like to, the committee to consider. So, in terms of the other areas, we, we will look in more detail in preparation for next week to make sure that things like the training, reporting and all of that does what we want it to do. I'm happy to open it to members now if they want to express views on things. Linda? Um, it's in relation to the legal aid one as well. And to be fair, my concerns around it are, are not necessarily in relation to cost because if something is right, it's right. And we have to find a way. And, and I get that we are, obviously, all of our ministers and the, the executive and this assembly as a whole is restricted in relation to our budget. We don't need to go over that again. But, you know, the, the cost of everything and the value of nothing is not the, the kind of government that we want to be, the kind of uh, executive that we want to be. So my concerns around it is, is it, is it good law? Is it going to actually do what we want it to do? And I do think we need to have more conversations with the department as to how can we actually do what we want it to do and what, what I know, to be fair, Rachel wants it to do because... It's a conversation we've had that we are consistently being approached by constituents who are the working poor, and it is mostly women, and it's mostly women in low-paid jobs. So where they're literally maybe a couple of hundred pounds over the threshold for being able to get legal aid. And somewhere along the line, whilst there will be cost to this, somewhere along the line there will be savings, because as I said it in the chamber the other night in a standby, there are women who, and men, who no doubt, whenever they have been bled dry and psychologically abused by being repeatedly taken back to court, that it comes to the point where having a job is either mentally or financially no longer an option for them. And there's a cost to us in that, because that individual will then end up on benefits, and perhaps with children living with them, benefits then to support their children, which they're absolutely entitled to. But it's not where they want it to be, and it's not where I want them to be. And I don't think it's where any of us want them to be. So I think if we really seriously want to address this issue, it might be, as I said in the in the chamber the other day, or the night, can't remember whether it was day or night or morning, whenever it was said, to be perfectly honest. Um, but is that there's a bigger piece of work here. And it is around the legal aid. And it's not about reducing the cost of legal aid. I know that the committee and, and the department have already, you know, have a focus on that and how do we reduce the legal aid bill. But this is not about reducing legal aid. But it is about shifting shifting the balance to make sure that victims are protected, that their families are protected, and that perpetrators are not abusing the legal aid system to further abuse their victims. And honestly, I don't know the answer to that. But I would like to have a conversation with the department around it. And if this has, has instigated the thinking around that, so this is not about you know, cutting, slicing off the top and reducing the, the bill to the legal aid. It is about making the legal aid process right. And it actually just highlights again, even from, from what Rachel said at the, at the committee or after the committee last week, around you know there are protections because you have to go through the same process as you have to go through for non-molestation orders. Well, I, I don't agree that the process for non-molestation orders is good. It's bad. It, it affects the same people that I'm talking about. And, and the same thing happens where they're repeatedly taken back to court. So they're bled dry. So all of this, I think, is, is actually a piece of work that needs to be looked at. And I would like to see it done in a, in a fulsome way, that we actually get the right results out of it, that we get the best results for the people who need it most. I'm going to leave it there but I, I, because I think it is actually a piece of work that needs to be looked at and I, I would like the department to, to perhaps look to, to doing something around that. Rachel. Thank you. Um, it was just, we want to start with the legal aid amendment, which is now obviously on the bill. Um, so it's no longer Rachel Wood's amendment. It's on the bill. Um, 
So, because uh, I have a, a number of comments to make about the reporting and independent oversight, because there's some quite significant changes that have been put in. Um, the A26 is problematic on so many levels. Um, on the face of it, for me, it completely undoes the will of the House, because this is now suggesting that before a period of two years, when chapters one and two come into operation, a report will be laid. That's not what the Assembly agreed to on, on Tuesday night or Wednesday morning. Um, certainly not what the intention of the amendment was, and certainly not any formed any of the debate, in my understanding, and I appreciate it was ten and a half hours long, so I could have maybe misinterpreted it, but that was not what the what was agreed to. Um, it also, and I agree um, with, with, with many comments that were made on Tuesday and with Linda, this needs to be a bigger piece of work. But that doesn't mean that it stops this from happening. Um, so if it means that it gets the ball rolling, per se, good. That's great. Um, but this, in terms of, of the minister um, and the department, say, tidying up or um, providing clarity in terms of what is, was Amendment 14, this is not what this is. Um, this kicks it down the line even further for me anyway. Um, it, the proposal that was agreed to on Tuesday is changing the purpose of the new clause um, in terms of widening access to legal aid for victims. I have a number of questions for the department on the rationale of it and it's in the minister's letter um, which states many things. So. Um, unintended consequences, still don't know what they are. Um, I certainly didn't get any clarity um, from the Minister about what those unintended consequences were and significant risk. Again, I'm, too, I'm not too sure about that. Maybe the committee could, could write in advance of next Thursday just to give us a, a fuller picture on a number of these things. What are those un unintended consequences? What is the significant risk? Um, Unnecessarily expensive. Again, we still have no clarity on how much they're talking about. I, I don't know anybody else. I didn't get to hear any figure um, when challenged on Tuesday. And also the leaving some of the most vulnerable victims without protection. I'm, I'm very un it was said a couple of times by MLAs on Tuesday. I'm un a bit unsure about what the most vulnerable victims would be. If you're talking in a financial sense, then surely those vulnerable victims would already apply and be eligible for legal aid if we're talking in a financial way. So it was mentioned about being on social security. That would qualify you for the legal aid. So this doesn't actually come into, this doesn't come into the discussion. So I'm certainly a bit confused about um, the leaving some of the most vulnerable victims and also about protection, the, this, the word, the use of without protection. This amendment isn't, wasn't ever about protection. There's no mention of the term protection in this amendment. <coughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure about the use of that language, just in terms of what it is referring to. Um, and then again, about some vulnerable people unable to afford. I appreciate that there are, in relevant cases, and like Linda said, that the, the process about non-molestation orders is not perfect at all. Um, that, in my understanding, was brought in by the previous Justice Minister, David Ford. So I would certainly welcome any moves to eliminate that and look at that as a whole piece of work. I don't see that in A26 as it's written. Um, it also does um, completely refine and then mean that uh, most people will not be able to get this because they'll need to have been proven to have had a conviction that would mean that if you were going through the criminal courts within the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill and your perpetrator or your, you, you haven't been seen to be A or B in the eyes of the law, if you were going through the family courts at the same time, this wouldn't be recognised. So it's, it really does um, limit eligibility way, way beyond what was agreed on Tuesday. And again, that would that I, I think that... Um, we should get some clarity on that, um, about where, where they foresee this eligibility or the waiver being limited to applicants. Uh, if the discussion and agreement on Tuesday was to actually go the opposite way, as had been suggested by the majority of people who wanted maybe this to be completely got rid of, that's actually the complete opposite direction. And 
in terms of getting proof of the waiver, which I know we've discussed at length, um, you know, th this can be done. It's already done. Health professionals, support organisations, social services. Surely the police would be involved in this as well, because incidents would be reported. Police staff would be involved. Officers would be involved. Um, so I think it's completely flawed um, to the specific detail of A26-2 says the relevant purpose is that making provision of, to the effect which is to A, require a qualifying client to incur no cost, and then C, to reduce the contribution pay, payable for a qualifying client. So I don't think those two line up unless I'm, I'm reading it wrong, but are they not completely completing? Or, sorry, competing? Um, That's points. A and C. A and, and C. C. Yeah. So it says to incur no cost yeah. and then reduce the um, contribution payable. So I'm not too sure. I've, and the, I know I've covered a number of issues there, but I think it would help the committee to understand where the minister is coming from with A26 if we got some clarity on, and I'm more than happy to outline them in proper questions, <laughs> if that would be of assistance. Yeah. Um, but certainly this, for me, does not fit the will of the Assembly that was shown on Tuesday. I can see merit in 2A if that was to be crystal clear in and of itself. Absolutely. Um, which would be in keeping with what the intent was behind the amendment. Um, but yes, the two years issue and subsequent elements of this presents a challenge, I think. However, the Speaker will have to decide whether it's admissible or not. If, if it's decided that this is actually undoing the intent of the Assembly, that would be a Speaker decision. Which is probably why we need to be working on the basis of a committee amendment. Alternatively, of course, Rachel's entitled to bring forward another refining amendment herself, but um, it might be that the committee wants to pick out elements of this and, and provide more clarity to it if that's needed. So, Chair, just on the reporting, I have, in terms of bringing back proposals, I have no issue with the Department wanting to bring a report in a couple of years' time to look at the entire legal aid system yeah. for victims of domestic abuse. But that shouldn't stop what was agreed on Tuesday from happening from now, if you, if you understand. Um, yeah, no, no. I think those two things are not competing and they can go very much hand in hand yeah. together. Yeah, and there's no doubt A26-1 is a, a delaying tactic. That's clear to me. Um, remove A26-1 and then include potentially 2A and the Minister might make the case what the qualify, qualifying client should be and members may take different views on that but all of that's predicated by actually can down the road for two years. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, as I indicated in the floor of the House, I am particularly um, pleased to see this on the face of the bill. And for a distinct reason, I think the Minister did make a fair point that there's a lot of work, and we've all reiterated that in terms of the broader piece on legal aid. But whenever we refine that and think, right, what is the intent of this bill? This is about domestic abuse. And we all know, I know we've avoided um, listing what domestic abuse is for good reason. You know, there's the definition isn't going to be prescriptive in terms of listings, but we all know the financial abuse associated to domestic abuse is something that has to be captured on the face of the bill. And that's why I think the argument fell about it um, not being, you know, that it should be somewhere in secondary legislation. But I don't think so. I think this domestic abuse bill, this is a very fitting piece that should be on the front of the bill. And although I had and re still have reservations about how um, it is presented on the face of the bill at this time, I don't think that detracts from the fact it needs to be there. But I think we've all come at it in many different ways. And I think it would be helpful for the committee to, I suppose, just go over what, what, what is our objective? Do we have a shared objective? Because certainly from my thinking, one of the strong reasons for it being it there is to prevent that repetitive nature of 
the victim being brought to court repetitively. Now, there's questions there. At what point is the victim a victim? And I know we touched on that with uh, Rachel last week and the explanation that came, but I think that does need to be teased out. Is it when somebody has satisfied the test to trigger the bill that they become a victim, in which case they have entitlement to legal aid? And would the legal aid only be um, if in a defence position and when the, the person bringing them to court is also the person who they are accusing, um, the perpetrator. So I think there does need to be refinement for it to sit on the face of primary legislation in this way. And I really do, I, I'm looking at the amendment from the minister and I'm not sure that even cuts it for me. It doesn't give me that clarity. So um, I suppose an explanation ahead of next week from the department would really help to start refining thoughts there. Um, because I don't think this is the place where we're going to fix legal aid, but I do think this is the place where we can address legal aid and the problems around that repetitive nature. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sinead. That's helpful. Paul Frey. Yeah, I agree entirely with that last point that Sinead makes. Uh, but before I go back onto that, uh, can I just say with regards to the letter, the communication with the Department and the Minister, I welcome the fact that we've got sight of these very quickly after consideration stage has to be welcomed uh, and it's a good piece of work to get that done so quick albeit some of them was already sitting there waiting to to move off the shelf that's fine the one that we're talking about now uh, wasn't that this has been made up uh, over the last number of uh, days maybe even hours uh, but I thank them for the speed in that regard and I welcome this conversation here because it will not only help members of this committee it will actually help the department too because they'll be listening in uh, so I'll give them good notice of what should be they should expect next week. Uh, with regards to the content of the minister's letter, uh, yeah, there's highlighted pieces here that I've, I've I worry about. So yes, legal aid legislation is complex and technical, and there can be unintended consequences uh, if something is unduly hurried. Yeah, I get that, but again, outline what they think the unintended consequences are with regards to this new clause, because this new clause only tackles one small aspect of the legal aid piece. It doesn't tackle, doesn't tackle legal aid reform, it's just one small piece. So again, tell us the unintended consequences of this small tweak. Uh, tweak's maybe not a nice word to use, but that's basically why I think it is. Um, on the potential of, uh, has the potential to prove unnecessary expense. Again, if it has the potential to prove unnecessary expense, then that means that that expense is being occur incurred as we speak. So again, we need to get a tighter spectrum and evaluation of this. I don't believe it is. I don't believe it is. Tens and tens of millions, uh, double figure millions. I, I don't, but if it is, let the department tell us in clear terms, and they have now the time uh, to do that. Uh, if if they are in a position, I'm quoting off the minister's letter. If they are in the position where their access to resources is being controlled by someone else, we're beyond that. We are beyond that. So we're not talking about. If you're still living in that world where you're a victim, continue to be a victim, and. You're at the point when someone is controlling your finances. There'll be no way you'll be taking them to court. No way. Or there'll be no way he or she would be taking you, the victim, to court. Just, I don't know that it would happen. So again, I think we need figures around that. Um, because what this new clause does is, is an advance of, of that, really. It, it's about, it's a, about a different form of domestic abuse, it's a, a co of coercive control. It's a different form, it's a much more advanced, nuanced form, which can continue after the victim has, have, has been able to remove themselves from the, the scene of the crime, if you like, or the domestic setting. So it's much more than that, and, and I don't get that at all, why, why the Minister needs that, because of, because of the controlling nature of, you know, of, of somebody's purse. On the actual wording itself, 
it, this is nothing but a delaying tactic to subvert the will of the House. I have no doubt about that. That's what it is. It's a tactic. Uh, this is not the committee speaking. This is not an individual member of the committee speaking. This is the House. The House has decided this. Now, with all due respect to the Minister and Department, if they, they have every right to amend and, and seek changes to this uh, new clause, what they can't do or what they shouldn't do is actually negate it completely, is actually stop it, halt it completely. Because what, they, what they're trying to do here is, is, is say that instead of this, instead of this change, um, they will bring a, a report at the uh, within the period of two years, which then may say something like this. It's not good enough. It's simply not good enough. The House has decided. Um, again, the points at section two. Uh, again, I, I don't understand why you need the three limbs of that. Uh, require a qualifying client to incur no cost, and then at C, reduce the contribution payable to by a qualifying client. There may be two tiers to this, and one may qualify and one might not. One might have to pay part. Again, tell us that. I'm not sure of that. That might be the case why there's three limbs there. Uh, so please provide uh, clarification around the purpose of... Uh, it's, it's, well, I know the purpose of Section 2 is basically declaring the purpose, but why then the, the three limbs? Uh, and yes, I worry about Section 4 with regards to the restrictions that may well be placed in this, which... which and I don't know the motivation. Is it, be, is it to try and tie the change down in more detail? Or is it trying to lessen the burden that they say is the cost? Which I don't agree with. But you, you know what I'm getting at. But, but can I say uh, to the department that... Yeah, they've given us, they've given us an idea here, I think. Because uh, I think most of us in the House demonstrated a frustration that we think, we suspect this, we could go further than the new clause from Rachel. Uh, we could go further than this, and we a lot of us illustrated that on the floor of the Assembly. But we just can't work out now how. Uh, and don't get me wrong, legal aid reform is a massive piece of work, much bigger than this, this bill could do. But what the new clause deals with is the aspect of the court proceedings being used as a weapon. And that's different from legal aid reform. It's part of it, but it's different. It doesn't encapsulate the whole legal aid reform piece. So it might be an idea that the Department of Justice, before the end of a period of two years, beginning from the day on which chapters one and two come into operation, lay before the Assembly a report setting out on how the Department is going to deal with all aspects of court proceedings being used as a tool or a weapon against a victim of domestic violence. So there could be a wider piece of work here. So I thank the, the Department for coming up with a form of words that we may use as a committee or individually uh, with regards to a further amendment and further consideration stage. Thank you. Is there any of the other amendments? Uh, I've taken note, there's a few. I just want to, maybe I'll just tidy up legal aid um, and then touch on the other ones. I suppose what I would like it in preparation for, for next week, um, and if it's not possible, it's not possible, but I would like all offences related to domestic abuse to be covered. So I would like to find out what is the relevant pieces of legislation that would need to be applied to, because obviously we're restricted to this bill um, in terms of the amendment that Rachel brought forward. But, um, I would like to know, is there a potential amendment that would make this applicable to all domestic abuse related offences? Um, I would also like to find out, can it be retrospectively applied to where convictions have already been secured? So I would like to find out if there can be a retrospective nature to something that's introduced. I do you think we need to find out what a qualifying victim is and the parameters for members to understand that, whether that's, as the Minister is trying to do, conviction needs to be secured for that. What are the other ways in which you can define a qualifying victim? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I would like to find out how you could get a, what, what are the potential parameters for a qualifying victim. 
um, and also then in terms of securing the removal of costs. Um, could an amendment be added to, to the bill that incorporates 2A, just so that that's crystal clear as to what we're trying to do? Um, so yeah, there are some of the things I would like in advance of next week. I, I, the two years, I think there's an irony there because they were opposed to the two years for Davos. Although this two years is just to come up with proposals that they may consider. So I'd be surprised, to be honest, if that gets approved by the Speaker. I'd be very surprised. And then putting that type of amendment forward, it actually then doesn't provide the refinement that the Department may have wished. So sometimes you've got to know when you've lost the battle mm -hmm. and, and just try and affect change in a slightly better way. You know, it's just, to me, trying to undo something. But, and you're right. Well, I've picked up that A26-1. Is there scope to apply that to other areas, not just legal aid, that we have to force the department to produce a report on the following? So that's, I think, just worth thinking about in terms of our own committee amendments. But it's clear to me, if we're going to have to refine the amendment, it's going to be a committee amendment or an individual amendment rather than the department if this is the approach that they're going to take on this area. Is there anything more in legal aid people want for in advance of next week to inform? I'll take Linda and then Paul. Uh, I think in, in relation to the conviction issue, there has to be an answer to that because there's an answer to it in relation to non molestation orders. So that there, is, there is an answer to that and I suppose just getting the information around that from the department, it's not something... That I, that I think will require a large amount of work because it will literally be looking at what what is in place for the non molestation orders and it'll be something pretty similar I would imagine. Um for that. I would actually like the department to explain to me exactly what their understanding exactly what their understanding is, not not what the problems are with this because I accept that there are issues for the department, I mean, we all have our own individual issues with it as well, and concerns. I need to know exactly what the depart department's understanding is of what this, exactly what it does. And I think that then gives Rachel an opportunity to challenge that or to accept, whichever it will be. And that then in turn will give the committee a better understanding of the whole issue. And if we are going to do an amendment, either as an individual committee member or as a committee or an individual member in the House, whoever chooses to do that, um, that we know what we're doing, that we know what we're doing, that we make the best law. Because for me, that's what this is about. And again, I said it in the Chamber on, on Tuesday, that this is about not just doing something, doing the right thing and getting it right and getting as right as we can. And Rachel said, and... and and, and I support her in that, that she welcomed amendments to improve. What she's concerned about is that the amendment is not improving, it's, it's negating, and, and, and I understand that fully. And I suppose I'm in a different position because the, the one that I had argued for around Operation Encompass is actually being enhanced, it's being improved. So um, I'm, in, I'm in a different position, but I would like to know what the department's understanding is of what what exactly the amendment currently does, how they can see that being improved, how they see this as improving it, because Rachel and other members were clear that amendments are more than welcomed from the department as long as they can outline how that's improving it. But Operation Encompass 1 probably doesn't even need fully explained, although we will have questions on it, but it, it's pretty clear that it is an improvement, that it is enhancing it. So I just want to be sure and content, and I mean, we abstained on this on the basis that I just want to be sure it's right. And it, it wasn't on the basis that I think that the intent wasn't right, because it's very clear in my speech and clear in previous conversations with Rachel, I accept that the intent of this is good and is right. I also accept we won't fix legal aid in this bill. But if we're going to fix a bit of it, I want it fixed. I wanted to meet the needs that I talked about when I spoke a few minutes ago. 
Yeah, just a very quick comment uh, around the scope. Uh, again, it's not a decision for anybody here, for the Speaker, but uh, I don't see how uh, reversing a clause in a bill that's been passed will meet scope. But uh, a new clause adding the requirement for report will, because of what you're actually delving into and reporting on has already been mentioned on the face of the bill with regards to this amendment. So it's just to make that point. Okay. Well, listen, I think there's plenty in preparation for this legal aid issue to be considered next week, which I think is probably the most detailed area that we need to look at. Um, there's other areas I think we, we will need to look at, but this is one that has kind of came in late. And we need to very quickly get our head around exactly what we're trying to do here um, so that if we improve it, we need to do that. The other amendments then... Um, sorry, Jeff, sorry. can I add to that? Um, just ahead of, um, I would urge the, uh, the department to bring any thoughts or papers to us as early on this as possible to give us all individually time to consider their perspective. Um, because I know even from the conversation today, we all seem to have individual different concerns. And I would be eager to follow the thread through um, you know, that whole definition of victim at what point it's made but also to know the parameters in terms of if a victim has established entitlement to legal aid, that that legal aid is, is it in a defence um, capacity and is it only linked to cases surrounding the domestic violence setting? So, for example, if, if you've established entitlement to legal aid, what are the parameters? Does that person then have legal aid for any case? Or any other item, or you know, item of business. So I do think there will need to be parameters that fit this bill, and I just think the earlier the conversation starts, the better. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Sinead. Okay. The other amendments then, Rachel. Um, thanks, Chair. No, it's just so with regard to the reporting and independent oversight. Um, which obviously, the committee had brought forward and agreed to. Um, they both have sunset provisions in them. Um, which means that they automatically end or will end when the department brings forward relevant regulations. So, I didn't, in terms of our committee discussions about these amendments, I don't think that was the intention of those amendments, that they were to um, have a sort of an end point. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, I, I don't agree with that approach in, in the amendments. You know, I do understand that there might be future scenarios where monitoring and evaluation exercises change or they're no longer required. And, um, but that shouldn't be decided automatically and should be based on evidence. Um, and they certainly shouldn't be subject to a limited level of assembly scrutiny um, and should be, again, agreed through uh, evidence and consensus by the assembly, um, certainly not through negative resolution. Um, the Independent Oversight Amendment gives the department's powers to decide when the appointment or rule will expire and specifies that regulations to determine this will be subject to negative resolution, which is not adequate and such an important role um, over this. So if the department want to give themselves power through amendments to determine when both reporting and oversight uh, will end, it certainly must at the very least be done through an affirmative resolution of the assembly. Um, and that could be the method for both oversight and reporting if that's where they're going to go. But I certainly was not my understanding in the, our committee amendments that these things would end. Okay. okay. Well, listen, there'll be more work done on what were the committee amendments and what now the further amendments, and we'll have that in advance of the next week and then officials. And again, just keep in mind the potential for a special sitting of the committee on Tuesday the 1st or we need to agree some amendments that we may well table. OK. Then the other uh, item on matters arising, um, the response from the department providing further information on the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme following the Minister's oral evidence session. Uh, the department has confirmed that there is an appeals mechanism for applications and that a project assessment will be carried out to provide independent assurance that the project is on track uh, to open for applications in early March 2021. The Department has highlighted that there has uh, been a, a necessity to reassess options for progressing the IT systems that will support the administration of the scheme. So that information is there for members 
to note unless there's further information being sought. Yes, Rachel. Thanks, Chair. Um, just with regard to the Commission for Victims and Survivors, the Commissioner's role is empty at the moment and has not been replaced. And it's my understanding that that um, position has a statutory duty to ensure policy is victim focused and victims' voices are being heard. So I'm just wondering how that oversight function is being done with regards to the Department of Justice setting up this scheme um, with, in the absence of a Commissioner for Victims and Survivors. I know there was some evidence taken at the Executive Office yesterday um, around some aspects of this. I don't know exactly what that covered, but obviously the the primary role for all of that would be the Executive Office Committee around the, the Commissioner. Um, but we can try and find out for, for members. Linda? Um, yeah, it, it is pro primarily the, the Executive Office. There's no doubt about it, but I have actually met with a number of different groups and organisations, and including um, WAVE, RFJ, and num a number of other victims groups on, on the victim form. And they are actually, they have all met with the Minister and with the officials. Um, from what I can gather, even the evidence session that we took here around the how, how it would work even around the medical um, reviews and things like that, there does seem to be good connection there between the officials and those groups and organisations because the issues that I was raising in, in fairness to everybody had already been raised by the groups and organisations and actually when I've spoke to the groups they're, they're content at, at a lot of the approach, I'm not saying they're content with everything they're certainly not and, and nor would, would any be, anybody be in circumstances like these but I think there is a far good amount of engagement we did ask um, what is happening in relation, I think we put a question in, in, in relation to what's happening around the victims and commissioners, so, because that was one of the questions that was raised by the groups and organisations that we met, and, and what, as far as I can gather, that position is, it is the intention to fill that position, but in the gap, what I did say to the, to the victims forum is that they don't need a commissioner to speak up that we, we are all accessible and they should be coming to us with any concerns and, and raising those concerns with us. The staff, in terms of Andrew, are still there in the Commissioner's office. He's very capable. I'm quite sure if, if the forum want to engage with any of us, I can speak for my party and, and, and I would like to think no other party would be any different given the issues that we're talking about will be very accessible to that forum and also to other groups because obviously not everybody's engaged with the forum so all other groups, ELA, SEF, RFJ, Pathfinding Consent or all, all of those groups and our way of groups and organisations we should all be engaging with them as much as we can and listening to their concerns but there is probably concern around an absence there in terms of advice then to the executive office through that, you know, through the, the commissioner's role. And it may be the commissioner's office is looking at this, it, despite there not being a commissioner, so to speak, or commissioner. So, um, Rachel, you were just wanting to come Yeah, back thanks. And it's, you know, and, and absolutely been meeting with the forum as well, but it's the statutory power, the statutory duty that the commissioner holds. Um, and, you know, the forum, absolutely, I think um, any MLA would be more than willing to, to meet with and listen to, to the needs of victims of crime, of course, but it's the statutory duty that that office holder has, which is not being met. Um, and whilst I appreciate this is a matter for the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to appoint, um, we've been told that there is a review of the position going on, um, but I just want, I would like to know how that statutory duty that comes with that office and not for the forum, because they, they can't do it, but it's that statutory duty of oversight and advice then, how is that being worked with the systems that the Department of Justice are putting into place? Uh, listen, I'm happy to raise it because it's a valid point, so if members are content, we will we will raise it, raise it directly with the Executive Office or we can do it via the Executive Committee. Um, I'm happy, listen, we will raise it directly with FM, DFM then and we'll copy the Chairman of the, who is the Chairman of the Executive Office? Colin McGrath. Colin McGrath. I will we'll copy Colin in then. 
Just a, a quick thing to add to what Rachel's saying because she's right in that in terms of the actual absence of a commissioner being there, we need to find out the information around that. But if I'm right, she's also asking in terms of that we ask of the DOJ department, how are they? I've given what what I know is happening only from making my groups, but we we'll we do need an official answer. I think Rachel's right in that. So how are they ensuring that they're getting? the right information and the right advice around what's going to be right for for the the victims in, yeah, in well, terms of this process. I think we could also just ask again just around the engagement with the Secretary of State. However, I read the article in the paper today where he is still insisting that all of the money for mm -hmm. the victim scheme should be borne by the executive here, which I just think is... I think there's outstanding correspondence for me. Uh, that, 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 that is a live request and as to where it's going around the finances of the, the scheme. Yeah, okay. The department and the minister had agreed to update us, but we're waiting. Yeah, well, listen, I'm happy. Let, let's get a, another update from the department on that issue and what Linda has outlined too. So we'll write the FM, the FM, and the justice minister, and we'll include the executive office. In respect of that, we'll ask the Executive Office Committee to keep us informed around that issue too, because um, they may be privy to information that might help us as well. Okay, item four, the draft three-year Northern Ireland Organised Crime Strategy, consultation and proposed next steps, pages 17 to 89 of your meeting pack, and we have officials joining us uh, for this. <coughs> So I think the official should be there um, by way of the start of the facility. Uh, good afternoon, folks. We can hear you. So I think I'm welcoming, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Cathy Galway, Deputy Director of Protection and Organised Crime Division, Sinead Simpson, Head of the Organised Crime Branch, and Andrea Watson, Organised Crime Branch, all from the Department of Justice. So you're very, very welcome to the meeting. Um, the session will be recorded by Hansard and a transcript will be published in due course. So I think I'm handing over to Ms Gal Galway at this stage and you're going to give us a, an overview and then there will be some questions. So Cathy. Okay. Thank you Chair. Can you hear us okay? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're grateful for the opportunity to update the committee on the outcome of the consultation on the draft organised crime strategy. As you will see from the briefing note, uh, following a short delay given the current context, the consultation on the draft strategy closed in October. The analysis of the responses is complete and the response summary document is being prepared. We aim to come back to the committee in relation to the consultation on proposed defences, which also closed at the same time, um, but this is currently uh, still under consideration. So coming back to the strategy, it builds on the arrangements already in place with the overarching aim of protecting individuals, communities and businesses in Northern Ireland from organised crime. It has been developed having engaged with members of the Organised Crime Task Force to consolidate and enhance our response to existing organised crime threats, as well as enable us to identify and respond swiftly and effectively to new and emerging crime types. It's set in the broader context of wider government outcomes and Department of Justice priorities. Uh, the overarching aim will be delivered through a set of strategic objectives which are grouped under four key themes and they are pursuing uh, offenders through investigation, disruption and prosecution, preparing and protecting individuals, communities, systems and businesses to mitigate vulnerability and impact, preventing, deterring and diverting people from engaging and re-engaging in organised crime and delivering these by working in partnership, creating a sustainable, efficient, effective and collaborative system response. The associated work streams to deliver the strategic objectives are proposed as a series of 29 steps or actions to be taken forward over a three year period and measured by indicators of success. The draft strategy, while highlighting the important role that operational law enforcement agencies play in protecting the public against organised crime, also recognises that a holistic and wider societal response is also required. Turning to the outcome of the consultation, an overview of the main findings from the consultation responses is included in the paper provided for today's session. 
As you will see from our briefing paper, we received 10 responses to the formal consultation and we acknowledge the useful and informative quality of those responses. As you can see, taken on a strictly numerical count, the responses are overwhelmingly positive and further analysis shows that generally, respondents supported the aims, objectives, thematic pillars and the outcomes. Respondents welcomed the alignment with the outcomes in the wider outcomes delivery plan and the consistency with the draft modern slavery strategy thematic pillars. A number of respondents highlighted the importance of prevention and deterrence, as well as the importance of working in partnership at local levels in order to build resilient communities, uh, um, as well as nationally and internationally. While the level of overall agreement is reassuring, respondents also made a number of helpful suggestions including calls for the courts to use the powers available to them and not hesitate to impose maximum sentences where appropriate, the need for resources to deal with EU exit given the consequences of uh, having a land border with, uh, with an EU state um, and where this will be seen as an opportunity by organised crime groups, the need for the strategy to be kept under review to ensure it's fit for purpose and that we can stay ahead of the vulnerabilities Examples were um, provided uh, and they included uh, those vulnerabilities created by the dark web, increased cybercrime or other future opportunities that organised crime groups could use to their advantage. More clarity was called for on the oversight arrangements for delivering the strategy and an amendment to the prevent objective or theme to reflect the needs of victims and communities rather than only appearing to focus on offenders. An enhanced role for PCSPs in helping to deliver the objectives, consideration of how the public is bought into the strategy and that includes uh, you know, reviewing the narrative around it, and for the strategy to be properly connected to all government departments and their work as well as local government. Commencement of assets recovery legislation and the creation of a system or structure for asset recovery and management. The briefing paper sets this out in more detail and in response to each question. So in terms of using that to update the strategy, we are proposing that uh, the finalised strategy or revised strategy will take account of those responses and recent progress made in relation to some actions such as the forthcoming commencement of the relevant provisions of the Criminal Finances Act and the outcome of the consultation on proposed defences by way of an update to those re relevant actions when it's ready. The development of the analytical forum and the combination of two separate productions aimed at improving our understanding of existing and emerging threats. Uh, assess threats and vulnerabilities as a result of EU exit and the need to reset the timeline for the strategy to begin from April 2021, given the delay in consultation and to enable us to prepare plans for the various work streams. I hope I've provided an update on the outcome of the consultation and how we propose, subject to the views of the committee, to reflect this mm -hmm. and some recent developments in finalising the strategy for publication in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Cathy. And I'm not sure if the screen you have of us is frozen. Um, I know from our side it's a frozen picture, but um, we, we can still hear you, so there's no problem about that. Um, but I'm not sure if you're actually getting the, the visual of the, the, the committee. Uh, we yeah, we can see you, so we can, Chair, and the rest of the committee. Um, I think we're just frozen, but if you're content to continue, or I can reset the call if you prefer. No, no, we're just listen. Let's we'll 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 keep going. We'll maybe get you to to reset it before the next session, because I know there'll be a changeover of officials once we get into the next item on our agenda. So, um, but listen, we'll, we'll keep going while we've got it, the connection. We can hear you clearly, so that's fine. Um, just in, in terms of the number. I see with 10, 10 people responded, which struck me as slightly low. Was there a reason that it was only 10, or maybe the key organisations that needed to respond did, um, and, and therefore we shouldn't be unduly concerned about it? Mm. Um, we're not unduly concerned. I mean, while the number is quite low, I think the quality of the responses has given us a lot to think about and has actually, it will help us to revise the strategy. Um, the key organisations, the PSNI, the, um, some of the um, PCSPs, the Policing Board, you know, and other organisations did respond. So while we had 10 responses, they were from organisations. Uh, so um, we're, we're, we're satisfied that we have, uh, you know, a, 
a, a high quality response in terms of the qualitative responses, even though the quantitative responses might not be, you know, what we ex what we hoped for. But it was publicised, and it, you know, it, it, it did go out uh, to public consultation. Likewise, on the proposed defences, we had fifteen responses. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the strategy, then um, obviously the the strategy group has a role in keeping the strategy under review. Um, is there a formal review mechanism um, in, envisaged? Yes, um, we we do envisage having um, a, a formal review point for the strategy and keeping the strategy um, constantly refreshed and updated. Actually. So, um, as Cathy says, yes, the, the, the OCTF strategy group will have a role um, to, to look at the, the strategy. I mean, obviously, in the world of organised criminality, it's a, it's a fast-paced world, so we will want to keep the strategy under review and make sure that it is keeping a pace with the with this type of criminality that we're dealing with. Um, as, the, as the briefing paper also outlines, uh, we've got four outcomes and six strategic objectives. Uh, we want to spend a little time over the next couple of months, as well as, um, as outlined by Cathy, taking on board some of the views that have been expressed in the consultation. But we also want to spend a little bit of time uh, to, to map those objectives across to uh, specific work streams and then to develop a performance monitoring framework, both quantitative and qualitative, to go along with that. So that will become the document that the, the, the strategy group can then use uh, to keep the strategy under under review. Okay, and I, I know in terms of the timing of this, um, the Brexit consequences that are that are coming, and I noted the minister's um, evidence that the you know, Northern Select Affairs Committee, or she spoke about a bonanza on the border. Will, will this strategy need to be changed subject to the outworkings of whatever is or isn't agreed between the United Kingdom and the European Union? The, the, the strategy document under um, uh, the, the first strand of the, of the strategy, um, there's, there's chunks of work there around the analytical piece. An important part of the work of the OCTF is to be aware of the emerging threats and to keep ahead of the emerging threats. So, um, you'll see under the first strand there's work around an analytical forum, uh, broadening the membership of that forum um, and getting to a place where we have a very good shared threat assessment. So uh, the, the, the thinking is that regardless of whatever the emerging threats are, regardless of how organised criminal, criminals would seek to exploit any vulnerabilities, whether that be around EU exit or whether that be anything in the course of the next three years, the thinking is if we get those structures right, then that will allow us to have a good data set that can then drive the joint um, tasking and coordinating um, that happens at an operational level. But, but that said, as Cathy has alluded to, we, the strategy will be kept under review. We are going through a process at the moment of reviewing our, our structures to make sure they're fit for purpose. Um, so we will continue. We, I think it, in this world, there is an imperative to keep what we're doing and how we're doing it under review to make sure we 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 keep on top of the issues. Yeah, I mean, um, it's essential that we understand the risks and threats in relation to organised crime, and and ensure that we're taking the necessary strategic and operational steps at a multi-agency level to mitigate those. So, um, in terms of this threat assessment and the actions around um, an assessed threat, that will be kept under review. And no matter what the outcome of the negotiations, as Sinead said, organised crime groups will circumvent it. They'll be really quick to um, diversify and adapt, and it's essential that we stay ahead of that. And working with our partners on a multi-agency basis and with wider partners across other departments, um, we are... Um, we are preparing for that at the moment, and we have information and share information across um, agencies and with other departments in terms of what we think the assessed um, threats are going to be. But if at the moment, at the minute, that's a you know there's some uncertainty, so we're working with that uncertainty in the same way as everybody else is at the minute. But we're trying our best to stay ahead of whatever the threats are. Okay, no, I, I'm just trying to understand. You see where this bonanza and how it's going to be created, because when I read your report, it already indicates nearly a quarter of organised crime gangs operate north and south, and that includes 
uh, drugs, fuel, firearms, counterfeit, counterband, cigarettes and alcohol. There's already a bonanza on the border in the current environment. Yes. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. so that, that's why I'm, I'm trying to understand how it could be created, because in my mind it already exists. Yeah. yeah, it already exists, but some of the uncertainties or some of the changes that may be brought in as a result of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol may create um, other opportunities for organised crime. It could also create uncertainty in terms of businesses or compliance. So there are additional things that could happen as a result of the EU exit. So there, there is already criminality, um, as you say, but that doesn't mean that that's the way it's going to continue. There could be other forms of criminality as a result of uncertainty and opportunities that, that may arise for organised crime. The key thing is that we are alive to those and the OCTF structures allow us um, a safe space to do that and to assess the threat um, and to monitor and keep under review what's happening and what we see because we could start to see increased prevalence of different crime types or an increased yeah. prevalence of a certain crime type as a result of um, EU exit. But it's fair to, fair to say, Chair, I mean, the, the uh, smuggling already exists, fraud already exists, so, so you're absolutely right. I suppose the issue um, that ourselves and, and law enforcement partners um, are, are, uh, will, will want to be alive to is what, what particular opportunities um, might exist uh, for different fraud offences um, as a result of, of different tariffs or what, what different types of, of, of smuggling um, as a result of the, the different tariffs. So, so you're quite right that the crimes already exist, the border already exists, differentials in tariff already exist. Um, but, but we know from our law enforcement partners that, that were there any, any changes in those that organised criminals will seek to exploit them. Um, and it's about us, us being ready for that. Okay, finally then, just for me, obviously important to implementation is the Criminal Finances Act of 2017. Um, is there a time frame for when that will be fully implemented? Um, I'll take that question, that's Andrea Watson. Um, so as you're aware, the Minister wrote to the Home Secretary in June asking her support to commence the, um, the provisions as soon as possible. Uh, we have been working with Home Office colleagues to put in place the necessary steps to, to achieve that. So we don't have a firm date yet. In 2021, um, the Home Secretary said it wasn't possible to um, to commit to a date this year due to the amount of um, EU exit related and COVID-19 related business at Parliament. So um, what we have made progress on is um, updating the Proceeds of Crime Act codes of practice. And I think you've got um, an item of business on your agenda today about that public consultation, which is due to go out on Monday. Um, th those codes need to be refreshed and republished before the parish can commence. Um, that consultation is scheduled to run until the end of January. And then the Home Office are going to schedule the dates for the commencement of the legislation. Um, so we'll probably be in a better place to give you an update on confirmed time scales um, at the end of January. But we're, work we're working quite closely. You know, we're working closely with our colleagues in the Home Office, and um, you know they have you know assured us that it will be as soon as possible, as soon as they get a, a parliamentary slot. So it will be in. Um, 2021, early 2021, but we don't have, uh, you know, we couldn't say it's one month or another, but um, they have committed to um, to getting a slot as quickly as possible so that everything can be commenced. And um, as Andrea said, work is continuing on the codes practice and the work that we need to do here to be ready for that. Okay, thank you. Um, I have Linda and Gordon indicating and Rachel, so I'm going to invite Linda if she can ask her questions and then I'll let Linda introduce Gordon. No problem, that's great. Thank you. For just picking up on the, on the point that the Chair made, and, and I've seen the article that, um, in relation to the Minister's comments yesterday at the Affairs Committee, and, and you've outlined obviously that, that a lot of the, the crime already exists, but there is the potential for additional, and we know that, we know whenever there's a hard border there's always going to be the potential for additional. Is one of the issues because because it is something that the minister said in her comments is is the is the ability then to deal 
with the criminals because the Minister said obviously that there are going to be issues or potential issues at least around the ability to extradite offenders. So is that I mean, one of the, the concerns from the Minister that, that she's not going to be able to actually hold these people to account or that the relevant authorities aren't going to be able to? Yeah, um, I mean, in the event that um, it's not possible to reach an agreement, um, there would be, um, you know, tools that we rely on that we wouldn't be able to use in terms of law enforcement and criminal justice. Um, and while that would result in some loss of capability, um, there are fallback options available for many of the measures. Um, they are and would be considered, you know, suboptimal, um, but and generally based on Council of Europe conventions. But um, we, you know, we we do have the ability and the capability to still um, use the, the tools available, but they wouldn't be, um, you, it, it wouldn't be as, as useful and as speedy as the tools that we have them at the moment. Um, but um, you know, key key issues for justice, you know, are are still being discussed. You know, and um, and uh, you know, we we may be able to. Um, ag agree other other arrangements. Just one point, just to add to what Cathy said. Um, I mean, colleagues in another part of the department are leading on this, but the um, negotiations on the future security partnership are also are obviously going to be important in this context and, and in terms of the, the access that the UK will get to, to EU measures. So um, I understand work is is continuing around that. Um, and as Cathy says, once we we see how those negotiations conclude around that, that future security partnership, we will see um, what we continue to have access to and what we don't, and then uh, we will then have to, our work is already ongoing to explore what the fallback position um, would be. Thank you, and, and just then to follow on from that, can you give us a, a bit of detail in terms of what steps will be taken to ensure the cross-border information sharing and cooperation, because obviously, we're in a different position to to other areas in relation to this. We do have that land border, and I know that there is some good work going on north and south between Gardaí and and PSNA, But just to, to establish what what's being done within the Justice Department specifically. Uh, yeah, no problem. Um, so the I suppose at a, at a strategic level, the the organised crime task force. Um, members may be aware it's, it comprises a strategy group and then a range of subgroups. So I suppose the first thing to say is the, the um, representatives um, of the uh, Garda Shikana um, and the, the revenue commissioners um, sit on appropriate um, uh, subgroups. Um, uh, a key um, structure to help with our um, uh, cross-border uh, work is the, the Joint Agency Task Force, obviously. Um, which is that's an operational organisation jointly chaired by the police and the, and the Garda, but which also includes NCA, HMRC, Criminal Assets Bureau, Irish Revenue Commissioners. And, and the purpose of the Joint Agency Task Force is to identify and assess the threat posed by cross border organised crime, uh, regardless of whether we're in a context of EU exit or, or not, um, and to coordinate cross border investigations and, and operational activity. Um, the, the, the strategic oversight group of the Joint Agency Task Force has determined priority thematic areas, um, including rural crime, human trafficking, financial crime, illicit drugs, immigration crime, excise and tax fraud. And you can, you can see that any number of those will be impacted uh, by, by the EU exit. So I would point to the, in answer to your question, the, the, the representation that there is uh, from our colleagues in the South on our OCTS structures and then specifically the, the Joint Agency Task Force. At, at a policy level, um, we would also um, be in contact with officials in the, the Department of Justice, as it now is, they've, they've, they've dropped the equality recently. Um, and there are obviously um, then uh, uh, cross-border uh, conversations uh, around a range of policy streams under the intergovernmental agreement. So I think there's 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 work going on at a number of levels to make sure that we're joined up across the border. Mm -hmm. And um, police forces on both sides of the border have acknowledged that partnership is key to addressing the activities of organised criminals. So there is strong police to police cooperation, as Sinead has said, and regular contact in all its forms. 
you know, information sharing and joint investigations, despite the challenges that the, that the loss of um, EU measures might bring, there, there is still that commitment to maintain partnership and to find ways to facilitate information and sharing and assistance if we need to. I appreciate that. Thank you. And, and then outside of, of the EU, or the, the, the Brexit issues, I think you've just answered this, to be fair. I was going to ask, was, was there any feed into this strategy in terms of North-South because organised crime is island-wide? But I think, given what you've just outlined, I'm assuming that was the vehicle for doing that, and it has happened. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. the, 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 in terms of how this strategy was, was developed, um, you know, developed over the last sort of um, 12 to 18 months, all the partners that are represented on the, the OCTF structures, which would include those that I've mentioned um, uh, from the, the guards and elsewhere, um, they would have been involved in, in informing the strategy and would have been involved in, in workshops um, mm -hmm. around it. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. And the Joint Agency Task Force, yeah. you know, it continues to play a key role in understanding and addressing the changing dynamics of cross-border organised crime. And um, that ongoing cooperation is essential. That's great, thank you. And this is my, my final question, you'll be, you'll be glad to hear. Just strategic objective 5.1 highlights the, the role of the courts and judiciary in setting appropriate sentences on sanctions that will act as deterrence. I'm just wondering what that means actually in practice. Does it amount to commitment to increase sentences for those found guilty or...? The, the, that, that particular objective um, refers to an effective justice system obviously underpins the, the, um, that strategic objective five. Um, that's a reference then to the wider work that's going on across the department in terms of speeding up justice, um, which has obviously been taken forward by, by other partners. The, the reference then says we recognise the role of the courts and the judiciary, including by setting appropriate sentences and sanctions. Um, obviously, the, the, the judiciary is, is, is independent and it, and it wouldn't be, be our place to, to put any strictures um, around that. Um, I think there is an opportunity though for us over the next period to look at, and this um, feeds into one of the other strategic objectives, um, it, I think it's it's incumbent on us to make sure that the law enforcement agencies have all of the powers and the tools that they need, which is why we want to, as Cathy and Andrea have referred to, bring forward the, the criminal finance changes that we need to. And then as also as Cathy has referred to, we want to um, progress the uh, the work that we're doing on the new organized crime offenses um, so that we can we can play our part to support law enforcement um, in, in bringing offenders uh, to the court so so no I don't think that that is about um, uh, putting strictures around the judiciary it's it's more about recognizing that there is work going on across the department to create a more effective justice system in, in, in its entirety which will obviously then have an impact on on, on how organized crime offenses are tackled Thank you very much, and the chair is back, so we can introduce Gordon. Yeah, Gordon. Thank you. Thanks, chair. Thanks very much for the information today. Just on the point the chair made about the, I suppose, the low uptake in relation to consultation responses. Why do you think that was the case? Do you think there's a lack of awareness, or lack of knowledge, or perhaps there's a fear factor as to why people didn't respond? Um, I, I think. Maybe some all of that, you know. Uh, uh, part of one, some of the responses actually highlighted the um, the language and the narrative uh, around the strategy. You know, it it probably is maybe not that accessible to some people, and um, uh, we did get feedback on that in terms of how we make it, uh, uh, you know, a much more sort of outward facing um, document, um, and we've reflected on that um, and. I think where we would come from is that in the annual report, the Organised Crime Task Force annual report and threat assessment that's published each year, the Organised Crime Task Force website, um, we really do want to do a, a review of some of the, of the communications around this and how we explain to the public what's happening. And actually, we had a recent workshop with the Organised Crime Task Force and um, there was discussion around the brand and, and the need to be more... Um, uh, to, to go out to the public more and explain what the Organised Crime Task Force is about, the impact of crime, and to actually explain 
um, what organised crime is. And there, ha there have been some um, previous publicity campaigns around this, um, but I think in terms of the, of, the, of the strategy, I'm not sure it's that unusual for this type of strategy to get you know, such a low response rate. Um, but uh, it's something for us to think about in terms of how we engage with the public once the strategy is finalised, we start to implement it and how we um, work with the public in terms of understanding what it is we are trying to do at a strategic level and what the operational partners are involved in and more importantly, the impact of crime and how the public understand and perceive crime. Um, so I, I think it's something to think about the next time or maybe I'm, I'm a different version of the strategy. So in other, in other you know, um, parts of government, they would put out a different format of the strategy or an, you know, a, a, an easier read or something like that. And it's maybe something to think about in future. Yeah. Just, just one thing to, to add um, to what Cathy has said. I mean, I think all of that points to us, the need for us to develop a, a strong communication strategy to go alongside the, the delivery of this strategy. And just one additional point, um, we uh, are, are as, as I've mentioned, we're, we're doing a review of our structures. And one of the, the things that we need to, we think we need to set up is, is a reference group um, and I would say a role for a range of organisations who could assist us in terms of making sure that, that the work that we're doing is properly explained to, to the public. Um, there's a role for the police and board, for PCSPs, for victim support, for business, mm -hmm. a range of organisations um, and I think that that, will, um, that has the potential to help us um, ensure that the work that we're doing and the work that sorry, of all of the collective agencies are doing, that that does get some tr traction within within the community. No, that's good. And, and thanks for that. I think you've answered that well. The, um, the whole awareness thing, I think, is very important. And I think the public, I know as a new member to this committee, I, I know very little about it. And I suppose we, we hear about it in the media about um, paramilitary crime. And that seems to be the big issue that and yet it's only about a third, I think, of, of uh, the total. It is a huge issue out there in communities and all the rest of it. But if we're going to build mm -hmm. confidence with, with the mm -hmm. community and with the public, they're going to have to be very mm -hmm. much aware and bought into this, and, and you need to build confidence with them. And obviously mm -hmm. a lot of that's done through policing. Uh, so the, I will strongly support the community policing issue. I think it's vital, mm -hmm. but um, I think it's important that uh, the, the, the task force will be working a lot on the intelligence that the, that the community police can, can pick up and feed in, and I think that's, that's important. And how would, was my second question, is how all these agencies work together on a daily basis to communicate information uh, that initially will come probably from the public or from from other sources, how is that communicated across the various organisations? Um, at, at an operational level? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, police, so so one example would be um, PSNI um, would have, uh, um, they would put out videos and, and disseminate key messages around crime. Um, they also um, are involved in scam wise and, and different initiatives where um, the information would be um, made available to the public. But um, each at, at, for example, PCSP level, um, you know, it, it is about how we link in and support communities to be more resilient and how we um, how any concerns or you know any specific concerns that are raised, how that feeds back into us and, um, at, at our level. I mean, strategically, we can work with the OCTF partners at an operational level, then each organization and each agency would have its own way of communicating. I think what, what, what you're suggesting, hopefully if I've picked you up right, is how we get that message collectively out to the public and how we then get message, get feedback in from the public yeah, yeah. to inform what we're doing. I suppose it's more about the information coming in and how is that fed into <coughs> the various organisations because it's going to depend, a lot of it's going to depend on intelligence and information that, that comes directly from the public, from what they see, from what they hear on a daily basis. And I think that's, that's, that's vitally important. And my last point, I suppose, is how effective do you think work is to date by the agencies without this, this strategy that you're, you're putting together? How effective do you think they have been? 
and, and we certainly we have discussed issues um, about modern slavery and human trafficking. To date, there's been, my understanding, there's been a rather low conviction rate in relation to dealing with those issues, and it's again a huge problem that's hidden. And the ordinary person in the street is not aware of it. They're aware of the the outcomes, I suppose, when they see through the media, but unfortunately they're not aware of the, the risks and the dangers on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think there's a lot has to be done to try and, and increase the, the whole public awareness of, of the number of major issues that you're, you're covering. And I, I think we would, we would absolutely agree, and I think that the, um, we've got two separate uh, strategies. We, we have a legal obligation to, to produce an annual uh, modern slavery strategy. Um, but modern slavery is, as you quite rightly say, one, one element of organised criminality. And I think, going back to an earlier conversation, that there is a big piece of work that we need to do around the, the communication um, and to raise awareness of the, of the different types of crime. One strand of the organised crime strategy is around um, raising awareness and building uh, community resilience. Um, in order to be, uh, um, to in order to be able to uh, protect themselves against the different uh, types of organised criminality, um, so I, I think we would, we would, that we would absolutely agree that that those there are a number of strands of work in the strategy that will allow us to pick up on, on some of the points that you've made. Just to go back to the previous point about the, the sharing of intelligence, the um, the police. HMRC and NCA are um, due to give a briefing to the committee on the 10th of December and um, it, they will be able to build on it, but they, they, they have um, a, a joint tasking and coordinating um, meetings or um, tasking coordinating groups um, and there would obviously be an interface between those groups and the, the, the police officers on the ground, the community police officers. Um, it might just it might be a point that it's worth teasing out more with the, the operational agencies about how all of that, that that works. Great, thank you. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Rachel Woods. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation in the briefing. Um, just following on from what Gordon has said with regards to communication, um, and, note, and, and talking about having different versions, like an easy read version, can I encourage you to do a children and young people's version as well? Because um, organised crime doesn't just affect those over 18. Um, yes. Very, very important to get the views and experiences of children and young people across our communities, um, which is notably lacking from majority of, of departments, not just, not just here. Um, but just to, if you if you're going to look at that in terms of an assistance from a reference group, if we can encourage you to get the children and young people's organisations on that as well, um, they've yes. keen, keen interest in youth justice um, and, and and issues affecting young people. Um, in terms of the threat assessment, that kind of caught my eye. I, I that was a, a career I had attempted to get into. Um, way, way before you this. You're already in it. I'm already in it. Um, in terms of risk assessment, assessing future risk, I've um, done quite a bit of studying on this and I'm, I'm fascinating um, jobs in, in that. Do you have, um, not that I'm looking at a new job, but um, do you have, have you employed risk assessors or is that contracted out? I'm absolutely fascinated about how you're doing this within the department. Okay, we we um, okay, the department does have an analytical um, services group, but that that they're not operating in, in this space. The, the the bulk of the analytical work is done by the PSNI analysts. The the department funds one of those posts to specifically support the work of the organised crime task force, and then obviously each of the other agencies, border force, HMRC, NCA, will have their own um, data capability. Um, and I suppose one of the strands of our strategy that is around, or one of the chunks of work under one of the objectives, is around making sure that we uh, continue to to join up those pieces of of data and those those analytical strands of work, so that we have a shared, agreed uh, threat assessment. So, so no, we we personally we are not in the space of being data analysts, yeah. um, but we we fund one of the posts mm -hmm. and, and the police have a have a team of analysts. Mm -hmm. um, to do and the, work. the NCA would have and their, they would their own yeah. analytical documents yeah. as well. And in terms of your earlier um, points, um, absolutely very happy to take those on board in terms of the members of the, the reference group. Mm -hmm. They're great suggestions and the, 
in terms of an easy read uh, mm -hmm. version of the, the strategy or indeed our annual report, but also it's something for us to think about in terms of you know just generally our mm -hmm. communication strategy. There there'll probably yeah. be other opportunities to take on board both those points. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was my next question in terms of budgetary allocations to risk assessments. Because um, you'd said about getting ahead of, of risk, that's a really, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very hard area to get into and, and, and be able to, to, basically you're predicting what's going to maybe happen. So and it just in terms of the budget allocated to risk assessment and future trends analysis with regard to risk, um, and threats, it would that's is that the, the budget allocated is the one post in the PSNI? The, so so we found one PSNI analyst to specifically support the organized crime task force. However, we have an analyst forum and that will have other PSNI analysts, that will have other analysts from all of the other agencies that we have on our um, uh, strategy group. Um, and also recently uh, we have broadened the membership of that, so we're bringing in analysts from other, other departments. So uh, whilst we're only funding one post, what we're trying to do is harness that capability that exists mm -hmm. across the, the range of organisations. They'd be funded within their own agencies. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the, why I've just got you here, because I noticed that um, on the agenda item later on, which has been referred to on the Criminal Finances Act, um, so I suppose without having to ask the chair to write a letter, I might try and try and get a question in, and it's a very brief question, um, and it will fit in then with this strategy. Um, but in terms of criminal financing and, and again organised crime, how much um, if has there, has there been any work done on online crime, and by by that I mean specifically on finances that are kept in the likes of Bitcoin and so on? Does that does that come in to, to play with, with both of those? So, so I think um, I'm happy to, 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 to answer that one. I think the strategy, um, one of the, I'm struggling now to find the, the right page. So strategic objective number two is around the effective capability tools. You'll see that there's a strong uh, thread running through that around um, uh, economic crime um, and understanding uh, what's going on uh, ensuring that the financial investigators and forensic accountants in each organisation are, 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 are up to speed and, and fully trained. Uh, we have a, a subgroup of the, the task force uh, which is specifically looking at criminal finances. Uh, so, and, and I know that the, the online side of that is something that, that, that they are addressing. So, um, so yes, it's, it's a feature of our work. Um, our annual report and threat assessment for 1920, which will hopefully go out in the next week or two, will give a little flavour of some of the work that has been going on in that space. Um, and then, and yes, it will it will continue to be to be a focus, and it's one area in particular where uh, agencies need to work very fast to keep ahead of, of what's going on in the in, in the world of organised criminality. Yep, thank you. It, it's seizure of it's seizure of assets. You know, and it's it's assets and cash value. So it's it's all sorts of things now are included in the in those provisions in terms of what can be seized. Um, and it would be vouchers, um, you know, jewelry, all everything that has a cash value. But we can come back to you on that um, particular point. No, oh, thank you. I had read that in terms of the vouchers and and, and that kind of thing. But I'd, maybe it was just it's the the use of the terms. But and we you know can yeah. through those criminal finance, you know, from, from the act and and seizures, can on you know basically online money. Um, that and, and that's what it is. Yeah. It's, it's it's money that's not it. It's it's not quantified in, in somebody's pocket. But it is online. Can that be seized as well? Is that something that is in in the act? And if not, could we look, you know, to, to doing something like that? Yeah. But it's it's it again. It, it being cheeky and asking you to speak to something that's not on this agenda. Um, <clears throat> finally, just in terms of the independent reporting commission, the, the report was uh, released two days ago on paramilitary activity in Northern Ireland, and I notice that on this. Um, this briefing, you do talk about the IRC report, but I take that would obviously for, been from last year's report. Um, will this strategy then be looked at in terms of the new report? Yes. Um, so we we will because there are a number of actions that are relevant to 
Um, so there are a number of um, recommendations or findings or, um, in the report that are relevant to um, organised crime and to this strategy. So this strategy is outward looking in terms of the recommendations, the TPP, um, the actions that are in the executive action plan and um, so things like the civil recovery of criminal assets and, and different uh, the proposed offences, they are all directly relevant to yeah. the um, the IRC and, and their findings. So um, some of the things are around you know progressing um, recommendations that we you know, that we already know about, and ju just I think in terms of the the report, it's saying you know please see that the consultation on the proposed defences has gone out. So they have noted that um, we are making progress on some areas. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Sinead Bradley, I think your hand. Yes, up. thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, a lot has been covered, but I suppose I would like to focus in on the, there was reference in your report to cyber crime. And I know that's increasingly something that um, I'm being made aware of you know, even at constituency level. And, and it does state in there that the common types of cybercrime in Northern Ireland, and it includes ransomware attacks and business email compromise and email spoofing. But what I don't understand, or I would say clarity on, is obviously that that's the, those attacks are happening in Northern Ireland, that's where the, the victim of the attack is. But maybe my perception is wrong in that a lot of that is actually and be initiated or the perpetrator is elsewhere. And if I am wrong in that, I'd appreciate correction. And if I'm not, then I'd also like to know within your strategy, what specialism do you have? Because this is a global problem. Uh, what specialism do you have to deal with that? Because I know that um, while the EU and Brexit, you know, and that's been spoken to here, um, this is a much wider piece that does require critical relationships across the globe. Yeah, I mean, criminal activity, um, where it is facilitated by technology, uh, um, is, you know, it's global. It is a global issue um, and it, it is a prominent feature of crime in Northern Ireland as well. So uh, you know, irrespective of where the perpetrator is, the impact is felt on communities and individuals in Northern Ireland. Um, the PSMI um, have cybercrime officers who work in partnership with businesses and local government agencies to run joint cyber awareness events for businesses and for individuals. So the expertise is actually in the agencies involved in terms of the department. We would rely on the expertise uh, in our relevant partner agencies in the OCTF. And there's a cyber cyber centre now established in um, Queen's. It's, it's a, an outward facing um, uh, facility to um, provide advice and guidance and best practice as well to a range of agencies and that's recently been established. Okay, but uh, could you just elaborate, has it been established if there is, because I know um, you're saying this, it, it doesn't really matter where the perpetrator is, but I believe there is, you know, if, ever, if it's a global problem, we have to get a global solution, so each place needs to step up and do in their part, and I'm just trying to get an idea or concept of how significant is this in Northern Ireland, as in, that the crime is starting here. Are being based here? I don't know if I can answer that um, here today, but I can get an answer for you um, in terms of the prevalence of it originating in Northern Ireland. Um, I mean, we we would, you know, know anecdotally that there that there are, you know, um, issues with cybercrime in Northern Ireland, but I, I couldn't give you a split in terms of how that looks from a Northern yeah. Ireland global perspective, but I will get that for you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. All three. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, can I ask how many strategies of this kind have we had in the past? <laughs> um, I think there was um, the original strategy was in 2010 or 2012, yeah. then one in 2014, one in 2016. Okay, thank you. Uh, with regards to the respondents, 10, I think, 10 was what you said. How many, of, them, how many of those were PCSPs? Three. Three. Right, okay, I thought it would like to be higher than that. 
Well, let me just double check my fingers, but I think it's three. Uh -huh. Yeah, three PCSPs and, and, um, responded. And whilst you maybe need to keep this confidential and, and secret to a certain degree, but of the seven remaining, are they all groups or individuals? Um, no, they're groups. So um, it includes a political party, the PSNI, the policing board, um, local councils, a uh, 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 a voluntary organisation and um, uh, local government. I mean, we can we can um, let the commit. We can send the committee the um, that you did the names of the organisations that have responded. Okay, so when you say local government and then you say local councils, are they two different things or? Sorry, um, it's Nilga and the um, and and then it's Nilga and then Derry City and Strabane District Council. So, right, okay. So Nilka has responded, a, a district council has responded to three PCSPs, a victims organisation and uh, the policing board and the PSNI. Okay. Why, why I ask that question, to be completely brutally honest, is just to know if, even, even whilst you've said that, that some of the respondents and some of the messaging coming back has been of a good value, what I wanted to, why I asked that question was to tease out their expertise in organised crime, um, and that's why I, that's why I asked the, the question. Uh, because even a PCSP and a local council, their main aim on objectives is not to fight organised crime. So, no. so no, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I think in terms of, of their responses, it's more about the impact yeah. on um, individuals and um, people who live in communities, and a lot of that was around how they wanted to support us yeah. in being able to engage with communities at a local level and being able to work with us to deliver some of the objectives. In terms of obviously other responses were much more around the um, the threat or the ability to deal with it at an operational level. I, I would say though, in terms of the responses, we have to bear in mind that all of the OCTF partners were really engaged in yeah. terms of delivering and developing the strategy. So um, they actually fed into the strategy uh, and it's based on all of the inputs from all of the OCTF partners who have that expertise and knowledge in terms of organised crime. Okay. I'm very aware that the perception of crime and the fear of crime is just as harmful sometimes as crime itself. I get that. Uh, and, and there is a, a great duty on us all in society to remove fear uh, from society and from, from people, especially vulnerable groups. But uh, having read the strategy, and I guess with any government strategy, there'll have to be a high level uh, attainment of it. And, and the people within the body of work that actually fights organised crime will get in and that the gritty. But a question I would have is, when I, and I was thinking about this when I was reading this, is how will this strategy actually stop a, a well-heeled solicitor or, or professional person from obtaining and buying prescription drugs? And how will it actually stop and prevent the money, the, the, the fuel smuggler who never gets arrested? How will it stop that person? Okay, well, it's the operational agencies who have a role in that. In, in terms of, maybe it'd be helpful if we set out what we think the strategy can support and, and will do. You know, so from our perspective at a strategic level, um, we see our role as chairing and supporting the OCTF structures and also bringing together all of those people and supporting that um, we also fund um, a number of posts, the analysts, we have an, a, an embedded uh, data coordinator and trainer in the PSNI for modern slavery. We convene and support the, uh, the analysts forum. So to, we see our role as enabling, including through funding and our ability then to um, use the asset recovery community scheme to fund um, particular interventions and picking up on, on, on Rachel's point around young people and um, and, and voluntary groups who can also engage with them. We also have the role in, in legislating, you know, in legislative um, proposals and taking those through subject to the assembly process. Um, we also have a role in communicating success and collating and disseminating the, the annual report and threat assessment. So for, 
we're, while we're not the operational delivery, we certainly see the strategy as being able to highlight um, and shine a light on key issues and raise awareness and overcome barriers that maybe some of those operational agencies are experiencing. So we have that role and this um, strategic framework gives them, I think, the enabling framework within which to work, to coordinate, to communicate and to be able to change things that are maybe not helping them currently to do exactly the things that you've just said. And just, just to add. To yep. Sorry. Sorry, I was just going to add to what, what Cathy has just said. I think a key thing for us is around the, the in, in terms of the two specific examples you've given, um, obtaining and, 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 and using prescription drug, drugs and, and fuel smuggling. I think that, that the, uh, over and above what the individual agencies can do uh, to, to pursue crime when it occurs, I think there's a big piece for us to, to lead on working with other agencies around the, the, the public awareness. Um, taking just the, the drugs one, for example, the, the drug subgroup of the Organised Crime Task Force is not just made up of the law enforcement agencies, we also have help and, and PHA on that. Uh, and I think that collectively we will, and work has been done over the last number of years, but going forward under this strategy, we will want to look to see what more we can do under that communications piece uh, uh, to, to reduce the demand uh, for, for um, uh, overuse of, of prescription drugs. I think there's a similar piece of work around each of the strands of the strategy to look to see what more can we do to reduce the demand uh, that then leads to the criminal activity and that then can support uh, and work alongside the, the, the work that the law enforcement agencies do to, to pursue. So, so strategic objective for prepare and, prepare and protect of our strategy is where I would see a lot of that, that work taking place. I, I must clarify my language in case I get a raft of emails. I wasn't picking on the solicitor class there, it was just an example. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. No, I, we understood. <laughs> can, I, can I ask then, it strikes me, and I'm no expert by any means, but it strikes me with regards to organised crime that there's two ways to hit them, and that is the money laundering aspect of their business, basically following the money, and then also intelligence-led policing, i.e. informants. Where, where, where in the strategy do, do we really delve into that, those aspects of fighting organised crime? So, so, so money laundering and and the and going after uh, the money is 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 covered in the um, objective to ensuring we've got effective capability and tools to, to tackle uh, the um, those particular aspects of of uh, criminality. Um, in terms of uh, intelligence led policing and, and informants, I, I think you're you're taking us into an operational space that we probably as the folk who are responsible for developing the strategy and supporting the task force probably wouldn't be best placed to, to get into. It, it might be an issue, again, that you might wish to raise with, with the operational agencies when they're at the committee on the 10th of December. I understand. I'm not Nobody seems to want to talk about that aspect of policing, uh, which I think is vital, to be fair, going forward. And, and I do think at some point we really do have to have a really big conversation about that. Because I think that's a tool in the armory right across this world uh, that, that policing need to have and use. Just on the aspect of strategic objective two to get you back onto your uh, your report and then more uh, a more uh, firm ground for yourselves. You ensure that we have effective capability tools and legislation to tackle organised crime effect in Northern Ireland. Where do you see at the minute the gaps in legislation for organised crime, fighting organised crime? So, so um, as Cathy alluded to it in our opening remarks, we, uh, at the same time as consulting on this strategy, we consulted on, on proposed new organised crime offences. Um, and uh, that consultation has closed and we would hope to come back to the committee uh, in the next couple of months with the, the outcome of that consultation. So um, there are uh, proposals that we have consulted upon around um, uh, uh, providing a definition um, of organ serious organised crime, uh, providing for offences of directing serious organised crime, and providing for offences of participating in serious organised crime. So those are those are three areas where um, previous uh, uh, members of the OCTF have I have identified issues, which is why we 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 prepared and 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 consulted on them. Um, 
we will need to now take a bit of time to look at the, the responses to those uh, to that consultation. I think it's obvious from the responses back that there's there's a bit of work that needs done um, around each of those before we would we would seek to progress them. Uh, in terms of other gaps, I mean obviously there's the Criminal Finances Act which we're hoping um, to progress. There, there aren't other areas that I that we're aware of, but um, it's something that we will wish to keep constantly under under review. Uh, we do dock in with our Home Office colleagues, our colleagues in, in Department of Justice in the South and Scottish colleagues, just to, to keep abreast of what's happening uh, nationally uh, in uh, right across the piece, but, but, but particularly in the area of the legislative tools that are available. Um, but I think the key things for us over the next year would be the Criminal Finances Act that Andre has alluded to and those proposals that, that we've just consulted on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other members? No, I just had a, a small point just in relation to um, the responses that came back around you know, that there needed to be a more victim-focused responsiveness. And I'm wondering how that objective is going to fit into what you're doing. Is there going to be a separate objective or is it something that's just going to run through the objectives that are already there? I think, I think um, for me, the, the answer to dealing with that uh, uh, response is twofold. I think, firstly, the uh, strategic objective four, I think we need to amend the wording of that to, to, to put it in black and white that that work strand will be, so it might be along the lines of work with individuals, businesses and communities to build resilience against organised crime and to ensure a system response that is focused on victim safety and well-being. So that then gets it in the strategy that that's what we're aiming for. I think then the second part of how I would answer that is, well, how do we actually make sure that that is what we do? And I would go back to the, the reference group that I, I, I referred to earlier. Um, we would be hoping to set up a reference group which will uh, I suppose across the piece help us to make sure that that what we we think is being delivered is actually what is being felt as being delivered on the ground um, and I would say that uh, organizations for example victim support might be prepared to be part of that uh, reference group in order to help us as we deliver the strategy make sure that it is actually focused you know how we deliver it is focused on victim safety and well-being so I think there's two elements yeah. there. Also, I think the responses, some of the responses said, you know, that the focus on the prevent element and um, seemed to be more on how we prevent it happening mm -hmm. and not enough of recognition of, well, when it does happen, how do we support victims of crime? So, you know, while it's really important to have that prevent um, strategy and to have those objectives, um, it does happen. And, and when it does happen, what are we doing for victims to support them through it? So. Uh, some respondents thought that the focus was um, you know, too much on preventing crime from happening and um, you know, people becoming drawn into criminality and not enough about um, realising and being realistic that it does still happen and when it happens, this strategy also needs to recognise that and do something about it. I accept that you know, there has to be a balance, but I don't think you can ever do too much around the preventing. So I actually appreciate that, that you have, have put a lot of effort in around the prevention. I, I probably think mm -hmm. just, and this is just a comment, I don't even expect you to come back on this, to, to be fair. I just think probably the, the prevention and early intervention needs to be more contextualised about what actually causes people to, to end up in, yeah. crime in terms of poverty and, yeah. and all those things, but uh -huh. I know you are aware of that. But it's well, that's just one of, that is one of the actions, though, in, in terms of um, you know doing much more of a research piece on um, what leads people to be drawn into organised crime and what are the risk factors um, for for um, for young people, particularly, um, getting drawn into um, um, criminal activity and risky behaviour. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably also worth highlighting that, I mean, this strategy is an organised crime strategy, but it's one of the number of pieces of work that are being taken forward across government, not just in, in DOJ. Um, so there are other pieces of work going on across this department around reducing offending and re-offending. There's, there's work being taken forward by the Youth Justice Agency. So I suppose um, at, the, at the introductory sections of our strategy, there is a recognition that this, this is this is this is one part of a holistic approach, um, and absolutely agree that the prevent and deter piece is, is probably one of the more important ones. 
You're absolutely right. It, 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 it is a bigger picture, and, and TEO and other departments need to be involved in it. Thank you very much for, for answering those, those questions. Thank you. Okay. Well, listen, there's no other members, so can I thank you all for taking the time with us this afternoon? At this stage, um, before the next set of officials come in, because I know you will probably need to wipe down and all the rest of it, but if the call could, if you could hang up and then redial, hopefully that will fix the, the visual for the next session, okay. if you have the right people there to do that. Do you want the next folk in just as soon as you're, just immediately, yes? Yes, listen, I, if, I, I can come back to them in five minutes if, if that's okay. I can move on and deal with another couple of items, but if that allows the, the call to be hung up and then redial, yeah. then that, that Yeah, works. we can reset the call at this end. We'll dial in again, and hopefully that'll fix the video call. Well, if you let your colleagues know, we'll come back to them um, at about four o'clock in five minutes' time. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, we will push on just to item six and then we'll come back to the other oral evidence session. Um, pages 211 to 217 of your meeting pack, so it's the Criminal Justice Criminal Reform Bill has been referred to the committee to undertake the committee stage of the bill. A provisional timetable for the committee stage will be provided at next week's committee meeting for consideration. Uh, in the meantime, proposals to seek written evidence have been provided for consideration. So. It is good practice that when seeking written evidence on a bill for a committee to issue a media signposting notice inviting organisations or individuals with an interest in the bill to submit written evidence and also to write to key stakeholders a draft media signposting notice to be placed in the three main newspapers and on the Assembly website is provided at page 213. Uh, the link to the committee web page notice will also be advertised on the committee Twitter account. Uh, it's proposed that the closing date for receipt of written submissions will be Friday the 15th of January. This takes account of the Christmas and New Year period. An updated list of key stakeholders, which includes a couple more organisations to which it is proposed to co the committee <coughs> should write to, is provided at pages 20 to 21 of the table pack. There's a draft letter to stakeholders inviting re uh, written evidence uh, is also in your meeting pack. So uh, if members are content with the date of Friday the 15th of January uh, for receipt of writ written evidence, then we'll agree that as the date. And if you're content, then we'll agree the draft media sign posting notice, if you're content. Agreed. Agreed. And if members are content mm -hmm. uh, to agree the updated list of key stakeholders to be invited to submit written evidence, we'll agree that list. Agreed. And then if members are content to agree the draft letter that will be sent to stakeholders, members are agreed. Agreed. Okay, so uh, an electronic bill folder will be set up on the ECP system uh, containing the bill and explanatory memorandum, background policy papers, research papers, written submissions and other documents to provide easy access for members to all of the relevant papers. You're well used to the procedure for legislation now, members. Yeah. Item 7, um, pages 219 to 229. The department proposes... Uh, to make a statutory rule to amend Rule 22 of the Parole Commissioner's Rules 2009 to introduce provisions which allow registered victims or other parties to receive summaries of parole decisions. On the 23rd of March 2018, the High Court in England and Wales found that the equivalent rule in England and Wales, which was Rule 25, uh, was unlawful. Key act, a key factor was the fundamental right of access to the court, for example, the ability for a victim to challenge a release decision by bringing judicial review proceedings. The court accepted that if the decision and the parole proceedings were entirely private, then the option of judicial review was effectively barred for victims. The relevant rules have been amended accordingly in England and Wales. This amendment to Rule 22 will similarly remove the prohibition on the disclosure of information about parole review findings, with a presumption that this will enable victims to receive summaries of the reasons for parole decisions. The statutory rule is subject to affirmative resolution procedure. Other members are content with the proposed statutory rule or are seeking any additional information? Members content? Agreed. Item 8, pages 231 to 444 of your meeting pack of development papers, the Department provided a written briefing paper on proposed consultation on Northern Ireland Proceeds of Crime Act Codes of Practice in relation to the commencement of the Northern Ireland Provisions of the Criminal Finances uh, 2017 Act. The Department's officials attended our committee meeting on the 20th of May earlier this year. 
outlined the proposals to commence provisions in the Criminal Finances Act relating to Northern Ireland. Following the session, the committee wrote to the Department requesting information on a range of issues and also wrote to the Northern Ireland Policing Board requesting its views on the issue. Responses from the Minister and Policing Board are available in your meeting pack. The Department intends to launch a nine-week public consultation on four of the codes on, on the 23rd of November to ensure the codes can be brought into operation on the same date as the commencement of the Outstanding Criminal Finances Act provisions. Uh, which the Minister has stressed to the Home Secretary should be brought in no later than March 2021. Consultation uh, must take place and the codes finalised. Uh, th three of the codes relating to Northern Ireland have been updated. They cover search, seizure and detention of property, search powers relating to recovery of cash and investigations. The fourth code is new and it covers search powers relating to the seizure of certain uh, personal property. To ensure consistency, the draft Northern Ireland codes follow the style and language of the Home Office codes and the Department is working closely with the Home Office to ensure accuracy and consistency. Uh, the Department will keep the committee updated if anything uh, notable arises in the consultation and then we will be advised of the outcome of that consultation in due course. So members, it's there by way of noting in terms of the proposed consultation on the codes and uh, we'll obviously consider the results of that consultation when they become available, unless there's any further points of clarity. Okay. Item Pretty 9. Well. Uh, the Department has provided a response to concerns raised by the Committee about the cessation of uh, funding for the Regional Support Hub Scheme and clarification on why funding has stopped if support hubs are included in the problem-solving justice strategy and are considered to be a useful initiative. The Department indicated that it's fully committed to support the hubs, recognises that they're an invalu invaluable resource within communities, says that each council was provided with a funding contribution towards admin costs of up to £3,600 per annum per hub for a three-year period, after which it was anticipated funding would be subsumed within normal running costs. The Department states this was agreed with councils at the point of accepting the additional support. The three-year period came to an end in September. And the department points out that not all councils have claimed the full account amount available, three councils not claiming at all. The department agreed to extend uh, existing funding, though, for a further six months for those four support hubs for which the three year period has come to an end while longer term options are being discussed. The department has advised that support hubs are included as part of the problem solving justice portfolio and is currently taking forward an independent evaluation of the support hub approach with the aim of identifying common issues and developing a level of consistency across all support hubs. It's intended that, that evaluation will be completed by the end of this year. So members, it's there now by way of noting um, in terms of the department's information, unless there's any more clarity needed for members. And if members are happy, we'll provide a copy of the department's response to the police board and Mid and East Antrim Borough Council, both of whom uh, corresponded with the committee on this matter. Obviously, there's six months further funding being provided while they continue to look at longer term issues. So, Linda and Rachel. I'm content with that and that there is six months further um, funding going to be provided, but I would like to hear what is going to happen then because, as we outlined before, it is in the department's five year strategy. Um, so, if it's in their strategy, then they've seen it as something that belongs to the department, it's going to be part of their strategy of <laughs> how they deal with the problems of injustice. So I think that, if it, that, that it is in their interest then to ensure that it is continued, that it is protected. So I would like an update at a further stage on exactly what is happening in relation to it. I mean, we obviously can, can speak as individual representatives to our own PCSPs if, if we so choose, but I also think we should keep in contact with the policing board in relation to this as well. Rachel? Thank you, yes, just would like a future update on what's happening um, specifically, um, as well dealing with, it's in the, in the five-year strategy, but they're also in the interim currently taking forward an independent evaluation. Surely an independent evaluation would have had to have come before it was put into the five-year strategy on the merit of the hubs, on you know how they operate, what's working well, and what changes could be made for improvements. Or I'm just maybe getting a wee bit confused about um, the order of, of things. Um, and if 
If an independent evaluation of a support hub approach is being taken place now, does that then affect the five-year strategy? Um, similarly then with the costings, is the 2021 projected spend is up to 30 grand, but in 2019-2020 it was 21, nearly 22. But is that, I'm, I'm, is that for the pending Belfast one, or why is there a significant projected increase? If members are happy, um, we'll, we'll ask that we get an update in terms of how they're going to deal with this in the long term. Obviously, they've extended this for six months. There's this evaluation coming in January, but that the committee would like to get an update as to how they're going to address this issue and address the points, Rachel, that you have made as well. Uh, there, to me, there's the, the key issue, as I would regard it, it's in their five-year strategy as this is a big thing for us and they're pulling out their funding. Personally, £3,500 for a council, they should be able to find it. That's, that's my view. Or they could say, well, it's only £45,000 or £30,000 for the department. Why is it a problem for the department? I don't think, to be honest, a dispute between a council and a department over such neg negligible amounts of money is really appropriate for a council and a department to be engaged in what they're doing. And we're then spending a lot of energy about what is a very negligible amount of money. My issue, as I see it, is oh, there's a principle here that the department has made it a big issue. And therefore, if it's a policy issue for them, resource should then follow that rather than asking council to do it. But I also don't like spending so much amount of time over a dispute around such a small amount of money that either party should be able to, to find within their existing resources. Yeah, this is a, this is a, a bigger principle even than the support hubs. If support hubs is a good idea, then let's get, get it enhanced. Um, the, the money aspect is a circular argument because it's all coming down to taxpayers or ratepayers' money anyhow. And of course we are talking about, we're talking about an official in uh, councils who, who is a piece on the chessboard used in an effective way. That's basically what we're talking about here. The bigger principle is this, and I've experienced this since I've been in the world of the Justice Committee, in that, see when there's joint partnerships, when it comes down to funding, there's a fundamental weakness in this because one body pulls out and leaves the other one stranded to the point where it can't be effective. So there's a bigger, broader principle here. We're talking about grant, we're talking about thousands of pounds, not millions. This, this is horrific that we're actually having to deal with this. Um, so yeah, let, let's keep the pressure on on this because it's just not, it's just not on that we would end up having to write and engage and correspond. If this is working, which I believe it is, it's making a difference to people's lives, especially the most vulnerable people. And it's all it is is placing a chess piece on the board in the right place to make the best difference. This is a no-brainer, and it's it's so if. If, if the Justice Department is loading it up, then they pay for it, and let's move on. Uh, likewise, if, if this is an official in the Council who it isn't their main remit, then, then why, would, why would Council divert that person out of their own means whenever they have a job to do in another guise? So you know, I do think it's unfair in Councils. And I do, I, I think that on this argument, I'm on the council side, but you know something, it's thousands of pounds, let's get it done, let's get it fixed, and let's make sure there's the future-proof support hubs going forward. I'll leave it there. Sinead, your hands up. Yeah, yeah, Chair, I do want to dwell on this, um, but I, I do think it is worthy. If it's a strategy, it should be clear and understood, and I don't understand the level of difference and disparity that runs through it you know different councillors in some parts it says um varying degrees of um collaboration and stuff it doesn't just doesn't, doesn't seem to have the hallmarks of a set piece that would warrant being part of a strategy so i do think it needs tidied up thank you okay well listen we'll correspond with the department uh, on this sure, can i just yes, sorry, respond then. to to what Sinead's just said to be honest, it's probably difficult to do anything more than that because it has to be voluntary. And so the, the issue around disparity, Sinead, is that in some areas, and this is a concern that we've had, but it's, it's something that's probably out of DOJ's control, 
but in some areas, not everybody is cooperating in the way and collaborating in the way you would like them to do. In some areas, it, the collaboration is excellent, and it just depends on whether the the different agencies buy into it. And it's out, that's that is outside of DOJ's capability to control that because. The hubs consist of PSNA, but they consist of the trusts, the housing executive, and all of those other bodies. And I would hope going forward that when those bodies see how well it works in the areas where it, they are working together and where all of the different agencies are engaged, that they will accept that they're actually losing out by not being involved in it because there's benefits to it for every different agency. It's not just benefits for PSNA or for, for justice, there, there are benefits right across the board. There are benefits for the health trust in terms of reduced calls to ambulance service where they're not necessarily the right service at that time. So, you know, it has a lot of benefits and I, I would hope that those who are not collaborating in the way or engaging in the way in which they should as statutory agencies will see the benefits of, of doing that when they see how well it works in other council areas. But you're right, it's, it's not good enough. But we yeah, I appreciate that and I appreciate what you're saying, Linda, but I just don't think we can have it both ways. It either is a strategic objective that's working or it's an attempt to build a strategy. But it can't be both. You know, if you haven't that level of variance, then you can't oversell it from the department's perspective to say this is what we're doing. Okay. Hopefully they'll get this sorted out sooner rather than later. Um I'll just conclude in terms of the other business, and then I'll come back to item five, the, the next uh, correspondence of which there's uh, 12 items, um, and I'll just draw attention to a couple of them. Um, item two, in terms of the correspondence, was from the Department advising the official court statistics for July to September, which were due to be published at the end of October. They will now be published later this month. And the department has provided management information on the emerging trend between the number of cases received and disposed by the courts on a week-to-week -week basis and an overview of the position in relation to each type of court business and the department has offered then to provide a further report um, in due course if anybody would find that helpful so it's information there um, for noting unless there's more information that members wish to, to raise we'll note that item of correspondence Item 7 is the Legal Services Agency Annual Report and Accounts for year ending 31st of March 2020. The Comptroller and Auditor General um, qualified the 2019-20 financial statements of the Legal Services Agency, highlighting material weakness in controls over fraud and error prevention and detection. So for those of us that have been on this committee before, um, this is another year of qualified accounts and has been for decades. Uh, and is one of the very few government bodies where year on year fraud error <laughs> comes up and the accounts therefore have to be qualified because of the inadequate processes. And uh, I can recall this committee in previous mandates looking into this in great detail around the role of the taxi master and standardised fee systems when it came to legal aid and uh, all of those type of issues. So th this is an area that this committee has looked at into previously. And it is difficult to get into the level of detail uh, around all of this too. But I was going to recommend to the committee that we would ask the Public Accounts Committee, because they have the financial expertise to drill into this in terms of the Northern Ireland Audit Office, that this is something that uh, they would consider, we can't direct them to, but that they would consider looking into and bringing their expertise um, to bear on it. If members are content, we'll write to the um, PAC highlighting the issue about the audited or the qualified nature of these uh, financial statements from the Legal Services Agency and asking them to consider carrying out an inquiry into that and looking into the matter further. Um, I would suggest this committee may want to, but we broadly can look at policy, but this is a detailed number crunching type issue. Um, and I've been here before and looked at it extensively before, uh, and I just think that um, this is something that the PAC, and I haven't spoken to the PAC chair or anybody on the committee about it, um, but I think we should invite them to, to consider looking at this issue if members are agreeable. I personally think it's more appropriate only in that, 
given that it is so detailed and it is around finances. And the truth of it is, even for those who are fully qualified around numbers, you can be baffled with numbers. It just depends how they're, they're given to you. So I, I think it it will be more relevant and, okay, and more likely to get an outcome if we give it to PAC. Okay, well, we will write to the PAC in, in respect of this issue. Um, I won't have any chairman's business um, on not taking any other business at this stage, I suppose, have no chairman's business. We'll go back to um, agenda item four, at which point, when it's concluded, I'll ask for any AOB before closing the meeting. Five. Five. Sorry, item five. Yes. One twice. <laughs> Just to be sure, to be sure. So, this is the. Um, Summary of responses and proposals for legislative changes in respect to the law on child sexual <coughs> exploitation. It was at our meeting on the 24th of September. The committee considered the summary of responses to the consultation uh, on, in this area and proposed next steps, including the legislative proposal for inclusion in the miscellaneous provisions bill, and then we agreed to schedule an oral evidence session. So, officials are hopefully able to join us. Via the Starleaf um, facility, and well, they're obviously there, but I think we're having the same technical <laughs> problems. Um, let me just check, Brian. Are you in 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 the building? I am indeed here. Ready and waiting. Um, the 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 video's frozen, so we're not going to be able to to see all of the expressive movements that officials always make when they're before the committee. But we can hear you loudly and clearly, so. Um, we'll, we'll proceed nevertheless in respect of this. Um, again, members, um, this will be coming forward as we'll hear through the miscellaneous provisions bill and that will give us a lot of opportunity to scrutinise legislative proposals. So um, I'll just put that caveat in before members obviously interrogate all of these issues. There will be another opportunity to, to do all of that. So let me formally welcome... Um, Brian, who is Director of the Criminal Justice Policy and Legislative Legacy Division, and also Ms. Uh, Suzanne Core in the Criminal Policy Branch of the Department of the Meeting. Um, the session will be reported by Hansard, a transcript of which will be published on the committee webpage in due course. So, Brian, I think I'm handing over to you at this stage for uh, an overview of the proposed way forward, and then members will have some questions. So, thank you, Brian. <coughs> Right, well, thank you, very much. thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for giving us the opportunity to, to give the committee a bit more information about um, both the legislation and what we're doing on some of the other issues which came out of the consultation exercise and at the review. The committee obviously saw the, the earlier paper, so you'll forgive me, and there might be a degree of repetition in this um, over overview, but in fact, it uh, may at least set everything into, into a good context. Um, <clears throat> The aim of the Child Sexual Exploitation Review was to improve the criminal law to provide better protection to children who are victims of sexual exploitation. And following on from that consultation on the review, we're actually bringing forward four elements of legislative change as part of the Justice and Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. Um, briefly, they are the removal of references to, in legislation to child prostitute, child prostitution and child pornography. The inclusion of live streaming images in child sexual, sexual exploitation offences, the pro prohibition of adults masquerading as children online, and the creation of a new offence of upskirting. Uh, <clears throat> three of those issues, um, terminology, live streaming and upskirting, received very strong support from, from consultees as part of the consultation. Uh, the fourth, uh, adults masquerading as children, uh, the department ori didn't originally um, propose to change the law in that area. Um, uh, we felt that the existing law was probably sufficient. However, there was very strong, uh, a number of respond respondents felt very strongly that a new offence was required. Uh, in addition, the, uh, the police service also advised us that a um, specific offence would allow them to intervene and safeguard children at an earlier stage. And based on that response and the police advice, the Minister has agreed that that would actually be included as a new offence. So you'll also note that one of the four isn't technically a child sexual exploitation issue, the upskirting. 
Um, the consultation provided an opportunity for us to actually include that as part of the overall of, um, consultation. Um, it's not really an offence we see necessarily as being related to specifically to child sexual exploitation, although there may be elements of it. Um, but certainly that new offence will actually allow us to improve the law around voyeurism and offer increased protection to those who are subject, subject to this objectionable behaviour. So, and of course, convicted offenders will also be subject to the sexual offender notification requirements. So though that's really what we'll be putting into the, into the miscellaneous provisions bill, there were three other areas of particular interest which we are giving careful consideration to. And I think it's fair to say we would see these as going into um, legislative uh, change in the next mandate. These are widening the scope of abuse of trust offences, uh, which are currently only apply in statutory settings, amending the defence of reasonable um, belief in offences against children, and granting police powers to request information on guests in hotels and other premises. Um, essentially, in each of these areas, <clears throat> where uh, they, um, we actually see there uh, would be a value in legislation, legislating, but for legal or other reasons, we think we need a little bit more time uh, to develop um, the, the relevant policy. On the abuse of trust offences, the department's initial view was, the, was that these did not need extending to, to include sports coaches and those working with young, young people. However, the responses to the consultation uh, were clear. The vast majority of respondents wanted the scope widened. Now, I have to say that it also included a number of sporting bodies who themselves would have been subject to any, any widening of that legislation. So overwhelmingly, respond respondents felt the protection provided by the abuse of trust offences should apply much more widely. And recognising the strength of those views, the Department has re revisited its position. And um, we are now engaging, or will be engaging with relevant stakeholders to develop a wider, robust definition of positions of trust with the intention of bringing forward legislation in the next mandate. There will, will be a bit of work on that definition. It's not as straightforward as it might seem. So we will work, to, uh, we work with our legal advisors and, and stakeholders and other interests really to, to produce a robust definition and then we'll be able to take that forward. In two other areas, we are working, working to bring forward legislation in the next mandate. There are two other areas we're working to bring forward legislation in the next mandate. These are amending the burden of proof for the defence of reasonable belief and police powers relating to um, information on guests. Both issues are fairly well supported in the consultation, but in each of them there's some important legal issues which we're going to have to bottom out before we can, take, we can develop legislation. Uh, I would note that the Bar Library, Law Society and PPS all express concerns about the impact that shifting the burden of proof of reasonable belief to the defendant might have on the right to a fair trial. So clearly we obviously have to, to, to make sure that the legislation is crafted in a way which actually ensures that we protect people's uh, rights under the uh, ECHR, while at the same time actually meet, meeting the policy intent. That again will take a bit of time. And finally, granting police, police the power to request information on guests staying at hotels and other such premises also raises important legal questions. While the priority must also always be the protection of those who may be vulnerable to exploitation, any new legislation must also be compliant with individuals' right to privacy and data protection legislation. The Minister is keen to strengthen the law in this area, and the Department is working closely with the Information Commissioner to ensure that any measures which are brought forward will be fully compliant and not open to challenge. The priority for the department in all these areas of work is the protection of those who may be vulnerable to child sexual exploitation. Where there is a clear need for legislation, the department is committed to bringing that forward in the most appropriate and timely manner. It is important that any new legislation is well focused and thought through to ensure that it delivers the required outcomes and can withstand challenge. Development of legislative proposals and subsequent drafting takes time. And the committee will, be well, will well appreciate the importance of getting the legislation right from the outset. I can assure members that the minister and officials are focused on improving protection for young people and stand with the committee in wanting to protect the young and the vulnerable in our community. I hope that the committee finds this briefing helpful and I'm of course very happy to take questions on these or any of the other areas covered by the, by the consultation. Okay, thank you, um, Brian. Um, for that overview and a very important piece of work um, in terms of the issues that are being covered 
and I've no doubt that whenever the legislation is brought forward, um, the committee are going to, to look at this in great detail, probably in the areas that aren't being included by the department, um, and obviously that's something just to bear in mind as we get to the committee um, consideration stage, um, that I suspect some of these areas members will be interested in. I'm, I'm just interested to find out, and this, this again is shows the depraved nature of some people out there, but the, the issue around child sex dolls, why, why, why do we need to undertake further engagement to make that illegal to, to sell and to have possession of? Should that not be straightforward? Uh, I think um, there is some work going on nationally looking at actually the impact and the use of child sex dolls and whether they actually are actually contributing to child sexual exploitation. Uh, I, I think essentially, uh, what we don't have at the moment is good evidence of the linkage between uh, the use of these or the production and, and use of these dolls and, and child sexual exploitation. There is work going on nationally. We felt, in fact, that to go forward legislation, it should be informed by, by good research and um, a, clear, a clear link between actually these, the production of these dolls uh, and, and actually a criminal offence. So it's not that we're saying we shouldn't do it, but what we're saying is, in fact, we don't have the information at this point, which would actually suggest to us that, this, that there is that direct link which actually sort of would justify legislation. There is work going ahead. We're, we're, we're linked into that work. And once that actually we're, that's been complete, we will be in a much better position to advise the committee as to, as to whether it would make good sense or not to proceed in that area. Okay, I'm going to bring members in straight away um, because I could cover a lot of things, but I'll let members, they may raise issues and that'll save me doing it. So, Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair. And, and you've actually just covered um, one of the, the questions that I wanted to ask, so I appreciate that. Just in terms of um, the issues that obviously have not been included around the, the abuse of trust offences in particular, and, and then obviously the reasonable belief in, in sexual defence cases, that defence. But around the, the abuse of trust first, I am a wee bit concerned that it's not included just on the basis that there is substantial evidence that there are a number of outstanding cases that can't be brought forward. And, and one of, I suppose one of the issues for me is to me, looking at it from a very simplistic view, and I'll admit this is a very simplistic view, but it looks like that you can only be guilty of this if you're a professional person, so if you're a teacher, um, if you're a doctor, but if you're a coach, a sports coach, or you know somebody who does some kind of volunteering work with young people, then somehow you're not. So. For me, that that's that's a concern. It's it's almost saying, and I accept that you know there is probably it's easier to control these issues in a professional body. So within us within a school, and it's all part of your teacher training. I get that, and it's very difficult at the best of times to get um, people in place to volunteer to work with young people because there are so many hoops to jump through, not difficult to get them to volunteer in the first place, because people in our community are very good in relation to these issues. But now, because there are so many hoops to jump through, it is a wee bit more difficult, because people are a wee bit more nervous about it, and, and nervous about having to jump through all those hoops. And I get that. So I understand the challenges to this. But I think we have to balance it out. About protect, Is this about protecting children? And that's what we're about in terms of this legislation. So whilst we have to take everything into consideration, I think the protection of, the, of the, the children involved has to be the utmost priority. And I'm not suggesting it's not, but it just that's, that's my concern, that there's a difference there being made, that you can only be guilty of this if you're in a, in a professional um, body or you are a professional person. And in, reason, in relation then to the defence, the defence of reasonable belief. I mean, I think others will go into this, but I, I have all sorts of concerns around it. I think that to place the main one being obviously to place the responsibility on a victim to prove that that person did not know you were underage, 
to me, just uh, again in a simplistic view, it seems incredulous. It just I, I, I don't understand it. But I accept that maybe further work needs to be done. I'm, I'm surprised, if I'm honest, that further work needs to be done in relation to both of those. But I'll, I'll let all the members come in on it because I am looking at both of them in a very simplistic view. I accept that. But sometimes these issues are and have to be looked at in a simplistic view to get it right. I'm going to let other members come in just here and I'm keen to hear what other members' views are, to be honest. Okay, I'm not sure, Brian, if you just want to give a, a brief commentary to right. Linda's comments. Well, yes, well, firstly, on the abuse of trust line, I think I absolutely understand where, where you're coming from, Linda. The, the, uh, Position is clearly the you know, abuse of trust. We're really talking about the you know, main abuse of trust related to people, children the ages of 16 to 16 and 17, because clearly uh, any sexual activity with any child younger than that would, would be actually would be charged under child sexual offences, and actually that, that would be fairly clear cut. So we're talking about children in that age group where you're finding people in positions of trust actually use that trust to gain sexual advantage or uh, sexually exploit the child. Um, I think, in fact, you know, our aim would have been, had we been able to come up, had there been a ready-made definition which we, everyone ag agreed with, we may well have actually included it in legislation now. But what we're saying is, in fact, we need a little bit more time to actually get to a, a definition uh, which would be acceptable um, on the legislation. So, in fact, really, it's not about saying we, we shouldn't legislate, we're just saying when we legislate, we must make sure it, that it is actually a robust legislation that captures just the sort of people you're talking about. Now, ultimately, we, 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 trying to get that definition is going to be where the, the, where the extra work is required. So I would see this as actually being what coming, coming in in the beginning of the next mandate as part of actually an, our next round of changes. Um, we, we, we're not in a position at this point to have that robust definition. Clearly, we've looked at some definitions. I know, you know, it's that the Republic of Ireland has uh, has used some, and that there are others in the air. Uh, but really, we do need to actually consult a, a bit more widely with legal and other experts to see can we come up with a robust definition which we can stand over and which will allow this legislation to go forward. On the um, <coughs> defence of reasonable belief. Um, and in essence, in fact, the um, majority of respondents were in favour of the burden in proof uh, are, are regarding reasonable, reasonable belief uh, being passed over to the defendant. However, in fact, uh, we got respondents, the responses from the Public Protection, uh, the PPS, the Bar Library and the Law Society all raised real concerns about the potential uh, for uh, interfering with a right, right to a fair trial. Um, and ultimately, in fact, um, Clearly, if you move the burden of proof over the defendant, that, that, that is quite a significant change. So what we're saying there, again, we need to actually have some more careful thought. You know, these, these sort of decisions can impact significantly on people's lives. It's important that we actually make sure we've got a very clear understanding of how the law will work and who it will be covering. So because we got such significant advice from essentially all the legal, legal quarters, uh, we felt, in fact, it, it was necessary to take some, take a, some, fur, some fur, give this some further consideration. We recognise it's a complex area of work, and, and ultimately, our aim is, in fact, not to inadvertently pick up where someone actually has a gen, has has generally made uh, um, had a had a misunderstanding about someone's age or whatever. You know, you clearly that we've got to make sure that we don't actually sort of criminalise people who shouldn't have been criminalised. But the reality is, in fact, we need a good, a robust working definition, and that allows us to move forward and move, put this into law. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Bradley. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, to speak briefly to any one of these items doesn't really do it justice, but I, I suppose really what I would say at this stage, I think it is a little bit disappointing um, when I go over the summary list of the intention of going forward that there probably um, could have been more achieved in the remainder of this mandate. And, you know, the chair, you rightly pointed out, it was the obvious one, um, the child sex dolls. It, 
It just doesn't appear to me um, that we have to wait for mounting evidence to prove that that's wrong. And I just think things like that, I can't understand the logic and just not moving ahead on something like that. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to bring in um, Emma. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, you, you have addressed some of um, my, my questions, but mine is more of a, I suppose, a comment at this stage on on what you have said um, around the abusive um, trust offences. It, it's extremely disappointing that the, the department have highlighted themselves that the vast majority of respondents were in favour of widening the scope of this, and that organisations that would have that this would have affected and would, would affect and um, have said that they are, are, are happy for this to take place. You know, this is one of the most important protections that we could possibly put in place for against the sexual exploitation of children. And the human rights organisations have also said that they would recommend that it, it, the criminalisation of adults that, that take part in this and this abuse of trust. Um, it, it's really disappointing that it's not um, probably a, a high up on a the department's priority list as it should be, to be honest. And um, just one second question, a brief question is, um, do you have, you, you said there in the next mandate that you're going to try to um, legislate for the um, defence of reasonable belief, but do you have a time frame of, of like, a, like, like an actual date? <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um you, made two, you raised two points. I suppose I have to set this into the context that, in fact, um, my division <coughs> is a rel relatively small division, which is actually sort of responsible for the legislative program, uh, driving a number of these things forward, uh, and also picking up a number of additional areas. We, we are actually trying to actually, essentially, we do have limited resource, and we're trying to actually get all these things to move forward. Uh, if I'd actually not had such a full agenda, we might have got a few of these things moving slightly faster. Uh, but the reality is, in fact, what we have to do is actually try to get the right, the right balance. On, on the um, first point about actually um, uh, abuse of trust, we absolutely recognise this as an issue. And in fact, had we actually been able to find a, a definition of, um, in time, we would certainly actually have, have gone to legislate. But the, but the reality was that the clock on the miscellaneous provisions bill was ticking. And actually, you know, it's already potentially now we put that uh, the um, uh, the drafting into the um, to the executive. Really, apart from a few additional issues uh, on the priority base, we might be able to put in, and we've already identified a few of those. It is actually quite hard for us to um, to, to actually fit anything more into that bill at this stage. Uh, we do have some work to do on this one, and, and to be frank, we actually have. Uh, it's important we get the legislation right, and it's better we have to take a little bit longer to make sure, in fact, the legislation is actually sort of spot on and actually hits all the marks. And we put something in which we then have to, we then find is inadequate in some way. So, and what we would be doing is, in fact, although actually clearly it's not going to fit into the legislative program this mandate, um, as the program is moving ahead, I'll be able to redeploy resources into actually doing the, the preparatory work before the end of this mandate. So. I would like to think by the end of the mandate we'll be in a, in a, in a position where we're ready for instructions. Um, and then uh, clearly we have, to get uh, we have to get authority from the executive to draft the legislation, but in fact we'll be in a position to do that very quickly. Um, and similarly on, on the, um, um, the next mandate question, what was the, the second question was about, um, um, uh, about reasonable belief. Well, again, on that one, it is actually very important where you actually are impacting on people's um, people's um, people's rights and actually their capacity uh, in making decisions to make sure that we actually get this exactly right. And again, this is one where we feel a little bit more work is needed to make sure we can produce robust legislation. It's important we get this legislation right, and it's also important we do it fairly quickly. So, whatever we are able to put into the miscellaneous provisions bill, we clearly have signals and we have got that in the other areas where we do need a bit of additional work we will do that work on the basis that we'll it will be ready to go at the beginning of the next mandate then of course it'll be a decision for ministers and the assembly as to the uh, what what order any bills bills uh, in the next mandate come in so i can't give timetables about that what i can say is in fact we would aim to have all these things ready ready to be drafted um, for the end by the end of this mandate so in fact there would be no delay Thanks, Emma. Gemma? 
Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Brian and Suzanne, for being here today. Um, we're obviously probably all aware of the high-profile incident of um, upskirting that happened in my own constituency a few years ago. Um, this highlighted, obviously, the inadequacy of the current laws around upskirting. Obviously, so that's, um, the proposal is, of a new offence of upskirting is very welcome. Um, and obviously, the case I am referring to happened in a school, and of course, that's not always the case. Um, but I do think there is a need to inform and educate on the fact that something that someone may think is harmless um, will soon hopefully be illegal and could result in them getting a criminal record. So my question is then, are there any plans to have conversations with the Department of Education in an attempt to educate our young people for a start around this and the other new offences? Um, <clears throat> I haven't actually spoken to the Department of Education yet on, on any of these matters. That being said, of course, clearly that they are we, they are aware because we actually have written to them about the miscellaneous provisions bill. I think actually, as we're moving on towards the legislation, as often happens with legislation, um, as we, we're moving ahead with it, we will actually be talking to other departments about the implications. We'll be looking with injustice both to make sure that staff are appropriately trained. Because clearly, in fact, it's not sufficient just to have some legislation in place. We have to make sure that, that in fact, um, all our staff are trained. And given that these issues relate more widely, it's important we also actually advise and, and promulgate information about the new legislation so that all of those, whether it's in education or youth clubs or other areas, uh, all of those people can actually sort of be uh, both aware of the new law and where, if there's training required, can undertake it. Uh, I'm not sure it's specific to schools particularly, but, but certainly I think we, I know I have spoken to on this, not this issue, but on other issues where we brought legislation in. I had conversations with education well in advance with a view to making sure that they are able to take on board any, any appropriate sort of um, uh, impacts on curriculum or otherwise. Um, but I, I would tell you now that one of the dilemmas has always been that the, the, the education system they have so much on their curriculum that usually, in fact, you know, your, the first response is, in fact, obviously, it's very difficult to actually bring about additional change. But certainly, I think that all of these new bits of legislation will actually have implications across society. And so we will certainly be making sure that staff for justice have appropriate training. And we'll certainly raise them with other organisations where, in fact, that they wish, who should be uh, aware of the, of the changes in the law and should be acting on them to perhaps change or uh, make, make aware of their staff where that's, net, where that's appropriate. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Gordon? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just quickly, Brian, are you satisfied that all the social media platforms are covered? And we do welcome, obviously, the inclusion of live stream images um, as an offence. Are you satisfied? We're all very much aware of the, the risks that there are out there for young people. Uh, there's so much engaged now in social media, and uh, I guess the parents' greatest nightmare, really, and the fear that the, the children will, will get access and be intimidated and bullied through social media. So have all those aspects been thought about, or are they included as best you can? Well, um I thought it's a good question. I think our aim in this legislation is to make sure it is actually sort of universally applicable. In other words, we recognise that social media opportunities keep changing. And so, it's, so our aim has been really to actually, on the, on the live streaming, uh, to work on the assumption that it would actually, any new, new, mechanism, new forms of social media which come along would also be apply, it would apply to them. Um, so, Whereas, you know, it's always hard to say, you know, in the future there won't be a new, new um, mechanisms coming up which actually um, fire, people find a way of abusing. Uh, but certainly the aim of the legislation is to actually be a, you know, of, of general cover. So, in fact, we're not saying it's specific to one form of social media or another. We're saying actually with live streaming, regardless what mechanism or what um, platform they use, would, would be covered. So, to that degree, I think it's actually as good as we can get. If, new, if people defy, devise clever new ways of actually getting around this, I mean, clearly that's, our job is actually to update the law and make sure it, it continues to be applicable. As it stands, we, we, we're, we're confident it's covering all the bases to make sure that that's in the social media recovered. Okay, right. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Um, a lot of what I had wanted to ask has been covered, but just to clarify the, the legal position on the abuse of trust, the moment, at the moment, adults in a non-statutory setting, such as sports coaches, not 
They are legally allowed to engage in sexual activity with 16 and 17 year olds in their care. They, they are, there's, uh, they actually, there's no, no restriction. 16 and 17 year olds actually have, have the capacity to consent to engage in, in sexual behavior. Now, at the end of the day, this is an issue about people who have, if you like, privileged access to those people, able to influence them, actually sort of be, being able to, to, to gain sexual favour, which in fact, on the basis of, of their position of trust. Uh, we recognise that this is an issue, and we are looking to see how we can actually get a, a suitable definition so we can, we can address it. That's actually our intention. But as it stands, we do, at one level, actually, I, I think someone mentioned earlier, that in fact, you know, are we not just, at the moment, just focusing on professionals, the people who are easy to get at? But when some, one level, actually, those, those, they were the people who obviously initially were, were, were the, um, the, the real concern. But, as, but we're quite clear that there are other people who are, who are in positions of trust. But how we define them? Because it's much more problematic. Because clearly you get people who work professionally, you get voluntary workers, you get people who, who serve in, uh, in um, all sorts of capacities who could be in a, in a position of trust. And we, what we do need to do is get some robust definition to make sure that they can be held to the same degree of account uh, as those in, in, in the statutory sector where we already have a, 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 a legislation in place. Okay, so is there any other legislation to that effect in, or to in effect across the rest of the UK and Ireland or any other sort of European countries yeah. that would have this in place? Well, certainly, in fact, that's one of the things we, we are looking at. I know certainly in Ireland that they do actually have, um, have, do have some legislation, which I think is more, more or less in loco parentis. Uh, or, um, um, and I think so that's something we can look at. And also, as you, or someone who's been responsible for the education, supervision, training, or, or welfare of the child. Um, and again, you know, that, that actually goes quite a bit of the way, but we're not absolutely sure it goes the whole way. And I think, in fact, there is an issue just about us looking. What we want to do is actually, with our legal advisor and talking to other interests, um, other stakeholders, to see can we get as good a definition as we can. Because whichever definition you get, you always draw a line somewhere. And it's a trick is to get to draw the line in a place where, you know, our, our, our intent is the same as actually the committee's. You know, we want to stop sexual, sexual exploitation. The question is, how do we do that in a safe and effective manner? And that's what we need a good definition for. Okay, thank you for that. Um, you'd said there about the when it was brought up earlier on is sort of using the term professionals and it, that that being the issue. And I note in the 2019 consultation document, there was mention of. Um, the department had asserted there was no clear evidence to indicate that children, children are experiencing sexual harm from those in positions of authority within non-state sector settings. Has there been research to suggest that, or is it a lack of data collection? Uh, it's probably, uh, it may be a lack of data collection. I, I think some, it may also be the fact that uh, where offences take place, they either uh, aren't, aren't um, spotted or else, in fact, they, they are labelled as something else. It's, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure there's widespread abuse here, but at the same time, it's very hard to tell. Uh, well, I think we've, we're quite happy that having had the consultation and the responses we've got from a number of very um, um, well-informed bodies, you know, I think we're happy enough that, in fact, this, this is actually needs, needs legislation. You know, the issue isn't about this, whether we should do it or not. The question is about how do we do it in a, in a safe and effective manner. And this can take us a little bit longer to, do, to actually get there, those definitions we are looking, we've certainly looked around the UK, we are looking elsewhere to see can we find um, uh, best, best practice elsewhere. And from that, we will come up, we will actually um, put forward legislation. We'll, put, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the point by the, uh, by, the, by the end of next year where we'll have actually um, got, um, arrived at a definition which we're happy with, and which we actually can then actually take forward into legislation. Thank you, and I appreciate that uh, you'd outline pressures on, on the team and, and, and sort of resourcing being an issue in and, and, and terms of putting different aspects of this forward within legislation. But just to pick up on what you said about the end of next year, so your time frame for getting a definition on what an abusive trust offence would look like is for the next 12 months. Is it, it could, I'm just, maybe again, I'm looking at it in a, it's a simplistic kind of way, but surely 
if it's already in legislation elsewhere and you'd said that you'd already conducted work on this, that w why would it take another 12 months? Well, to be honest, actually, realistically, we actually, if we can't get it into, the, into, into, it's not going to take 12 months of solid work. If we can't get it into legislation in this mandate, which we're not going to be able to do, um, but if we can't do it in that way, then in fact, what we're doing, we'll be actually setting it to make sure we have ourselves in the right place by the end of the mandate. Uh, now, at the end of the day, the team are doing this. They're also looking at things like strangulation. We've got rough sex consultation out. We're looking at Charlotte's Law alongside this. There's a number of things which we are actually, that we are actually um, doing at the same time. And clearly, what we're, my, my aim is to make the best use of my resources to make sure that we use them effectively. To, to get to, to the right to, the, to where we want need to be, clearly the, where we've got things which we're going to likely to go into legislation in the next mandate, um, for me to, to ex put prioritise those in, in, in a, against, say, a strangulation review or a rough sex or Charlotte's law. Uh, if, if I was bringing those forward, I'd be pushing some of those other things backwards. Um, I can't do anything about putting new legislation in, in this mandate on that. So, in fact, if you like the the, the timetable. Uh, I would work to is one where I would get this done alongside all these other things in the time to make where where it can, uh, the information can be used effectively. So, in, so if you like, the time frame for the legislation will be: I want to be in a place where I can draft instructions by the end of the mandate. So, in fact, you know, I can get authority to do that with the, the office of the legislative council, and then that that will, can be ready for fairly early on in the mandate in the next mandate. Um, if I did it actually, if I prioritise this in, in front of some of the other things that my team at teams uh, are doing, uh, I would push back the other work, and, and that might that might generate a, a lesser advantage. So in fact, insofar as if I if I get it finished earlier, I'll just sit on it. Um, I can't do anything more than I'll be doing once I'm at that point. It makes more sense for me to time it so in fact it fits into the best use of my and my resources. Okay, thank you, Brent. Um, it's not in any way in any way to undervalue it. It's okay. just, in fact, realistically, if I can get it into the, if I can't get it into legislation in this mandate, it has to go into the next one. I want to make sure I'm in the right place for when it when it when it when it needs to be to be ready. No, I appreciate that. Uh, um, so, just in terms of prioritisation, the get, getting an abuse of trust offence definition is below prioritisation of strangulation and rough sex defence, which hasn't been consulted on yet, and this has. No, no. <clears throat> Sorry, I, maybe I didn't make myself clear. <clears throat> I, if I if I pushed it ahead of those things, I would push them back. Fair enough. Um, if I and I had had the in, in definition um, in the next three or four months, it would then sit uh, sit somewhere because I wouldn't have authority to, to actually to, to draft legislation. It would go into the next mandate. I can't actually I can't actually at this stage. It's for ministers to decide on the priority orders of, of the legislation in the next mandate. Uh, but what I can do is actually have this ready to go, ready to be, ready to get authority to actually uh, draft the legislation uh, as early as possible I can in the next mandate. So if I, so prioritising it so I, I actually I, it sits in my desk for uh, for a year, it wouldn't make an awful lot of sense. You know what I'm saying is if I've got a finite amount of resource, it's important actually that in fact this goes ahead so it's ready when, when we can take it forward. And, and, and because we, we, it's, we will, it will and it is too late to get into the miscellaneous provisions bill, <clears throat> it, it, um, it means in fact um, we're working to, to that slightly later timetable, or that slightly later timeline. Okay, Brent, I'm, I'm apologies for, for continuing on with this because I have a couple, a couple of other questions on, on, on different aspects of this. But in, you mentioned about not having authority to draft a legislation. Is that coming from the minister? No, it comes, the, the executive requirements are, if I'm actually to, dra to engage with the Office of Legislative Draftsmen to actually draft, for them to draft legislation, I need the authority of the executive to do so. Uh, and initially, actually, um, and that's that's a, that's true for all legislation. At the moment, actually, um, the um, the um, miscellaneous provisions bill had gone to the executives out last week, or very recently, uh, to seek seek authority. Now, in practice, actually, um, you can sometimes where some of that's coming along, we might get some some uh, some additional work on. Uh, but in fact, it's now we're now getting to the stage where that where that goes forward. But you have we have, we are required to get executive authority to draft legislation. Okay. And that, that's true for all, for all bills. So, in fact, it's not, not, not the ministers, um, 
and we'll put the thing forward whenever, whenever, um, whenever the letter, when we're ready to when we're ready to deal with that. We've got instructions ready, and we're ready to get to the, the OLC. But we do need authority for the OLC to take on the draft legislation. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll move on very, and very quickly just on a different um, aspects of this. One is on the child pornography and child prostitution. In terms of what you're looking at for this, it maybe um, it's too early to say um, of what the terms would look or read like. Um, but and, and I appreciate that we'll see this in the miscellaneous provisions bill when it comes. But is it is the wording sort of similar? Are you looking for similarities between England and Wales? I think our aim is, in fact, we're moving away from actually those those phrases which are wholly inappropriate to abuse children, abused abused children, and that's what they are. They're children who are, have been abused, sexually abused. And so, yeah, in essence, what we we seem to have, have inherited are archaic expressions which actually appear to, to put the responsibility on the child uh, for whatever actions uh, they're engaged in. Uh, that's obviously inappropriate. They are exploited children. So, in fact, exploited children, abused children, you know, clearly we, uh, there would be a number of definitions you may use, but it'd be along those lines. And that's not dissimilar from the rest of the UK. Okay. Um, just in terms of, if you, I wonder if you have had any discussions with um, England and Wales about, or with the Ministry of Justice and Department of Education colleagues um, to assess and understand their experiences of new terms, because it's my understanding that following legislative changes from the Serious Crime Act in 2015, that there have been difficulties with the terms that they had adopted. And certainly within the consultation responses, there'd been a number of other options outlined. So just to see if that, if the department were going down the line of England and Wales, if, if so, why? And what other options they've considering with that? Well, we will always talk, when we're developing legislation, where there are models from other, other jurisdictions, we'll always look at those. And to be honest, actually, with Northern Ireland sometimes has the advantage. Beyond, in fact, in some of these areas, we might, we're, sometimes we're slightly behind them, but in fact, we do actually get, we do tend to get, um, we learn from their mistakes. Now, and, um, and in this case, clearly, um, I think the intention, no doubt, was, was appropriate in England and Wales as well. And if they've got it wrong, uh, absolutely, we'll like we'll want to learn from from their their errors, and you know, terminology um, is sometimes difficult. It can it can change over time, and sometimes the same same words mean different things to different people. So I, I think we're very happy to actually learn from uh, from the, from their their, their mistakes um, if, if they have made any. But, but certainly, we will be we are in touch with our other jurisdictions. We're looking at what they what they've done and and the, the impact of it and. If there are lessons to learn, I'm, we are very happy to learn them as we go along. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and just lastly, with relation to the use of remote evidence centres um, and live links, um, are there any plans to place or in place to give victims and witnesses access to facilities within a reasonable travelling distance? Or how are these centres being <coughs> opened and unpicked by the department? Well, there's always a dilemma in, in when you're dealing with areas like this, where clearly what we want to do is get the right facilities, uh, but at the same time, there's only so many so many facilities you can actually run. There's only so many you need, and there's always a challenge about how, where you play, where you site them, and how actually they're how accessible they are to people. Um, I am. I'm, this isn't an area I'm, I'm, I'm actually responsible for myself. Um, clearly, I'm dealing with the legislation, um, but uh, I'll be dealing with legislation. But in fact, I am, my understanding is we're going to start off initially. Um, the, 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 I know the Criminal Justice Board agreed, I think, a few months ago that we'd take a three-phased approach. Initially, producing a, um, a basic but a short-term contingent, contingency facility just so we can get things running. I think that's, the aim is to get that going early next year um, and then from that then go to a, to a phase two um, a longer term solution well, um, which maybe will run for 12 18 months while we develop perhaps a uh, the, 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 the final product which would be a long-term remote evidence facility let's see long-term remote evidence facilities for the Belfast area it's that that's the initial plan to be honest I think this will be a state a staged approach as we will clearly learn uh, we'll learn lessons from each each of those phases, and from those, we'll let, no doubt, see how best we can move forward. But you do have the practical dilemma 
they're more than likely not a large place. The number of cases at any one time will not be probably not be that that, that great. And actually, you can't run facilities if, unless they're being used a reason, to a reasonable degree. Because they, they, it, it, they are quite resource intense. Because obviously, to, to be effective, they, they need the appropriate support and staff. Um, so that's one which, again, I, I'm sure you will get more information from um, from my colleagues on that one. I'm not best placed because I'm not directly involved um, in the planning of those. But I know that will be one of the dilemmas they have about how do you actually put, locate this to actually give you the, the best uh, the best service, recognising both you need to give people access, but also you have to put in place expert and scarce resource to actually provide the appropriate support. Uh, I know actually there is, of course, um, the, the um, NSP, NSPCC uh, have a remote access place in Bishop Street, I think in Derry. So, you know, it may well be, you're not talking about, it may well be there might be one staff set uh, unit uh, at the outset. But there may also be other opportunities for, to, to working with others and in giving additional support elsewhere. But again, I say I'm not I'm not the expert on this to this topic, so I'm just giving you my sort of general perception. No, thank you, Brian. I appreciate your answers. Obviously, it should be based where it's needed um, and and who needs to access it. So, no, I absolutely appreciate that and appreciate it's not in not your direct remit. But thank you for your answers. Okay, um, thank you, Rachel. Um, Linda wants to come in and then she need you have your hand raised still. I don't know if that's from previously, but I will come to you if it stays up. Um, and Apologies, so we'll put it down. Thank you, Chair. No, that's okay. Thank you, Sinead. So, um, Linda and then Paul. Um, one quick question. Thank you for, for your answers so far. A, a quick question and then something that I want to suggest the committee might want to do. In terms of the online anonymity, the department has stated that cybercrime isn't devolved. Will that impact on the department's ability to tackle online stalking as part of the upcoming stalking bill? Yeah, the, uh, the stalking bill actually will should... In essence, in fact, the stalking bill should give us actually sort of the, the necessary power to deal with, deal with that. Because ultimately, in fact, um, so, uh, this, this, that sort of online sort of access and uh, online harassment would actually fit very well into the, into, the, into, the, into the legislation we're developing. So, in fact, it would be picked up by that. Um, so, on that basis, it, there's not a great deal of point trying to do something specific and different. Uh, uh, it, it would be covered. So this is our expectation is the online stalk, this, the stalking bill will actually cover the online thing and it will certainly give the police, um, the, police the powers to actually sort of uh, put in place um, stalking prevention orders uh, um, so um, at an early stage if, if in fact that, that form of harassment is taking place. That's brilliant, thank you. Just in terms, of, sorry, not a question for your shelves, Brian, thank you very much for, for all of your answers. Just for the chair, based on some of the issues raised um, by other members, in particular Gemma, just in relation to the education piece, I think it is important. It's not it's not the responsibility of DOJ. So what I would think is that we potentially might want to write to the Education Minister to flag this up. And I think of it even just in terms of the age of consent. And it's been a while since I've been at school, I'll be honest about it, but I did ask a few of my younger colleagues was it something that was ever raised during their time at school? And they all confirmed that it wasn't. And I think that's a massive issue. That we have potentially 17 and 18 year olds out there who have 15, 16 year old girlfriends and boyfriends and whatever our own beliefs around having sexual activity at that age and outside of it, look, that's everybody's entirely, everybody's own place to believe what they want to believe. But they don't know they're actually committing a criminal act. They may know, I shouldn't be doing this, this is not entirely right. I don't think my parents would approve or whatever, you know, whatever people's beliefs might be, that's, that's a separate issue. But I'm pretty certain most of them wouldn't know that they're committing a criminal act. Some may, but I think there'd be, I think there'd be quite a substantial number who don't. So we already have that existing legislation that they don't know about, and I think they should. I think we should be doing education around that. And then we have the potential for, for this new legislation around upskirting and other issues. And I think it's really, really important. This won't be all down to, ed to the Education Department, to be fair. It's, it's legislation, and DOJ will have a responsibility around creating awareness. And Rachel actually raised it earlier on. How do we communicate to young people? 
you know, how do we, how do we do things in a way that young people get it and understand it? And so, and, and the department did take that on board whenever Rachel said it around their communications and how they how they do that in a way that is was understood and young people friendly. And I think that's really, really important. So DOJ have some responsibility, but I think we should write to the education minister just in relation to, to where specifically there's legislation that is most likely to impact many young people. We should be trying to get that to them through the schools. If it's not a specific education piece, there has to be some way of getting it into schools. I, I just think that's very important. I, I think we're potentially as a, a legislature, ignoring the potential that we're allowing young people to commit criminal acts and we're not doing anything to try and make them aware that it is a criminal act in the first place. You know, and what our view is around the age of consent and all of those, those are all separate issues. I just think that young people have a right to know. Well, Actually, there, are two, there are a couple of opportunities the education service have. One, the sex education, which in fact can be a mechanism. The other one is actually good sort of citizenship education, which again is about actually getting children to understand where they are in, in society and the law and how it relates to them. So yeah, there are actually mechanisms which the education service can actually use to actually de deliver that sort of information. But I think you're right, it is actually, it's probably variable across, across schools and across uh, the, the province, and, uh, and it, uh, it, um, it is one which clearly has to be brought to people's to youngsters' attention. Could we write to Education Minister? Well, I, I'm happy to pick up on that point at this stage. I suspect there will be a lot of things when we scrutinise this legislation that we're going to be saying there needs to be education and different departments are going to have a role. I'm always wary at this very premature stage to start flagging up Here's an issue that we want the committee, the education minister, to address, and also it's not it's the education minister that's doing it. So I just put that caveat, and I know from education as well, whenever you get into um, sex education and all of that, this again interferes with parental choice, and some may choose not to have their child in this, and then there's board of governors' responsibilities about what happens in the school. I'm not fully across exactly how an education system would operate. For me to be able to say, I want to write to the education minister to say to him, tell schools to provide this kind of information. I'm not telling schools to do it. I think that, because I, I, I know that that's an issue. I do think that we should ask the education minister what is happening, what do we as the educational responsibility around this, because this isn't about. I, I, I actually agree with, with Brian that it, there are places there for it because there are those, those different things within the um, education system already around sex education and, and you know life skills and all of those different things. But this is about protecting children from unwittingly carrying out a criminal act. And, and it, I have no doubt that we all know, I'm quite certain, that it's happening every day. And my fear for those young people is that they end up with a criminal record. It, is going to ruin their lives. It is going to ruin their potential for good kids who, who wouldn't do any harm to anybody, who aren't having an ounce of badness in them, end up with a criminal record that could potentially affect what type of job they will have if they, if they can get a job. You know, I, I just I have real concerns. This, I suppose it just raised it in my head and brought me back to a time in my life when I was younger and I, knew, I know that I wouldn't have known I certainly wouldn't have known, and I wouldn't call myself uneducated or somebody who didn't inform myself around things. So it was. I just think that there I, is I, an issue there. I, I don't. I don't disagree. I don't want to direct the education minister. No, no. To, to and I, 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 I don't Sorry. disagree in that. Um, for me, and I would want to have a lot more information about what is the current responsibility of the education authority, the Department of Education, schools. Is this being provided? I'm always worried about writing officially on behalf of a committee without knowing exactly what it is you know if we're pointing out to an issue that maybe isn't an issue and we don't know but I'm more than happy that we try and get information on this but I oh, ask the question but but I also think there's a, 
we're going into what an education department does, and just as I indicated at the start, I'm not, I, listen, I don't mind, I write letters to whoever, you know, and to me this isn't, but there's a wider issue about us as a committee writing to other departmental ministers about things as well, and committees that are here to do that, and who's responsible for doing all of that, you know, so I have no problem writing out, but in all of that, We'll write out, we'll get a response, and that's fine. We'll see what that response indicates. But well, can, I, can I couch it in a different way? That we ask the Minister what is in place in terms of educationally. If we're not content, then I would like to come back to this department and say, you need to do something that's not happening through the, the education department because that is part of, um, for me, <laughs> problem solving justice because, and, and, and youth justice about protecting our young people from ending up in the... In the well, uh, you know, and again, I'm going to write to the education system. minister, but I'm more than happy to ask the Department of Justice how does it work with its Department of Education and so on to make sure that criminal law is informed right across our government sectors. So, but listen, I, I'm, I'm yeah. Look, I don't care how we find out. We're splitting hairs. Let's spoil it down. There's, just, that. Down there's that. just a principal <laughs> issue here too about how how far we go as a committee, writing to different ministers and and the kind of work that that then generates too for for the committee. Um, so I don't mind. Like I can write to the Department of Education, but Paul. Okay, thank you, Brian. Are you still there after that conversation? <laughs> I am indeed. I'm listening. I'm very intently. Very good. Uh, can I first of all thank you for your time and your presentation and your answers have been very informative and the way you've laid out your presentation here, the, the, what we've got in our, our, our files is very, very good, very easy to read, so thank you. Um, just on that point, that last point, not to open up another debate in here, but uh, not only do, if, if this leads to a conviction, not only do young people get convictions, but I, my understanding is they're on the sex offenders list. Now, they'll not be high risk, of course. Uh, so yes. yeah, there, there was there was uh, a debate in the last term in the assembly whereby it was it was it was determined that the department would look at hardening young people whenever the age of consent changed. Uh, now of course those young people won't be young anymore. Uh, was there any work done on that that you know of? And if not, can you get can you get us information on that if it's not at hand? I'm, I know we are we are looking more more generally, <clears throat> say pardoning. Um, certainly, the, the um, there is work looking at things like the rehabilitation of offenders legislation about how long it is before a, 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 um, an offence is spent, and we're doing some work on that at the moment uh, on pardoning. Um, I'm not aware of, I, it may just have passed me by, but I'm not aware of any work on that, but, I, but in fact I can certainly look, on, look at that it's, um, to see if I can find out. Um, it doesn't ring any bells for me, so in fact so I'm, I can't give you an answer there, but I'm happy to have a look and then come back to you on that. The logic and why I think it's important is this, uh, if, 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 if a government decides to change the age of consent on anything, then, then what, you know, someone convicted months before would not be convicted months after and there's a fairness here uh, so again for someone living with that and, and because of, because of that type of crime and conviction comes mm. with a long lasting list aspect scenario or a stigma stigmatization uh, to it <coughs> then I think that's something that and, and again I was given a commitment, I think, on the floor of the assembly by the minister of the time to look at that. So, uh, if you could, it may, have been, it may have been looked at by some other part of the department. It hasn't been looked at by 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 my division. So, again, I'll have a look and see can I Please find do. out about that. Please uh, do. Thank you. I'm, uh, my my suspicion is, in fact, you know, there's not a big number of these offences no. No. Uh, uh, in that area. But by and large, um, whereas obviously the police will obviously have to follow the law. I, I suspect they. Um, um, where you've got very near near age cases, they, they are much less serious than where you found, say, a, a twenty-something year old actually um, engaging with with a youngster um, of for, for sex uh, would be much more serious. I think if it's a seventeen-year-old who has a girlfriend who's fifteen and a half, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure they would automatically result in prosecution. No, I'm not um, sure. But at the same time, 
Um, so I, so there may well be a number of cases could be quite small, yep. but I'm happy to have a look and, and, and come back to you on that. I agree with you. I think the numbers will be small, but I think it's the principle of the thing in this regard. Uh, and again, uh, I, I would ask you to have a wee look at that for me. Um, with regards to the stocking piece that was raised here, I know it's not in the paper, but uh, do you know when that's going before the executive? With, with regards to the process you outlined, with regards to the process, do you know when that stocking bill is oh. going? Stocking legislation, where um, so it's um, I'm trying to think all the dates where I'm aiming to get the thing onto onto the floor of the house, either the end of end of December or beginning of January. It slipped a few weeks, just um, um, but in fact, we, we, it is in the process of going. It may well be up to the executive now. Actually, I've lost track of the actual the, the, the date it was going up, but in fact, we are quite well advanced on that. The legislation is, uh, is drafted. And we're just going. We're just jumping through the hoops. And normally, it takes us about a month once we've got the, the drafting finished. The drafting finished a few weeks ago um, to our satisfaction in the office of the legislative draftsman. Um, so you know, it, it should be on. If it's not on the floor um, before immediately before Christmas, it'd be immediately after. And that's you know still on track for for us to get to get the thing through uh, along the time the time scale we uh, we advised about previously. Thank you. So so. Coming to the presentation here today, uh, I know that the Chair and others have asked questions around the child sex dolls issue. Uh, now, this strikes me as something that uh, we shouldn't have a wait and see attitude or approach on. Uh, I note, I note the, the, the concern by some of the sectors and the charities saying this is an emerging area of concern. So can I ask then on this issue, where, what is it we're grappling with? Is it is it the linkage? Is it the linkage between ownership and possession of a, sex, a child sex doll, and then the linkage between an actual child and and the protection of children, is the problem, or is it tariffs, or is it what what is it the is actually the problem and holding holding up work in this regard? No, I think in fact. The, the, these things have been produced, and I have to say, I, I, this is quite new to me when I came to this job. I, I hadn't realised actually you had these these things available. Um, <clears throat> the thing is, in my understanding, is in fact, obviously the concern is that, that you're finding people who have tendencies towards abusing children are actually um, buying these devices, and actually maybe that's um, now. I suppose it depends. Psychologists might say this might well be a substitution effect. It might well actually. Um, um, protect children equally. It could be the case that you know, the, uh, the charities would say this is just a step step in the wrong direction, and therefore, in fact, if you impeded or if you took that away, that might make a difference. The, the truth is, in fact, it's not clear which it is, and, and uh, the, the Home Office and National Crime Agency are actually doing some work on this, and and certain and I. I think, in fact, given that we have scant information, I couldn't even tell you <coughs> how many sex, child sex dolls that might, might come into the North, into Northern Ireland. We just don't have the information. So, is there is there any evidence? <coughs> is there any evidence out there, credible evidence of substitution? To be honest, <coughs> um, we, we, what we don't have here is actually a very good handle on this because it's not an issue. I not, don't recall any cases. Uh, going past and past my my desk ever about child sex dolls. Clearly, um, uh, nationally, it's probably not not been a big issue. Though it could well be a growing one if the charities are saying that's the case. Um, what we really want to do is actually get a good handle on actually it is actually, it is actually leading to criminal behaviour, and that's what the Home Office and the National Crime Agency are working on. Um, so essentially, in fact, <clears throat> I suppose it's better you legislate on the basis of inf uh, good information. Than based on on the you know um, supposition, uh, so I think that in essence, in fact, uh, if in fact the evidence was to emerge that this was actually indeed actually sort of dangerous or leading to criminal behaviour, then in fact we would have the basis for moving forward. But as it stands, what we haven't got is actually a sound a sound basis for actually legislating. So. <clears throat> is, is, um, I, like you, I'm a bit suspicious about the whole thing. But at the same time, I can't I, I can't tell you whether my my suspicions uh, amount to 
uh, anything substantial or, or not. So in fact, we need more information. Is, is this something that Papani organisations are looking at or, in, or, or considering when they look at high-risk offenders or uh, even suspects for that matter with regards to PSNI? Do you know? Well, I, I suspect probably I'd be I'd be surprised if they were, but because I'm not sure this is actually sort of um, something on, on, on uh, uh, many people's radar. And and at the moment, I'm not actually sure if you saw that the the person who actually was engaged with a sex doll. I'm not actually sure what the conclusion you draw, because we don't have um, the, the information. So in fact, uh, <coughs> my guess, my guess is actually this is a very low level. I'm not sure this has actually been a, a particular issue in that or not, though, though in fact I can't, in all honesty, I can't say for sure one way or the other. I think this is an area of potential concern. We need to get more information. If we get more information and actually it looks at that, actually it is a, a pointer or a marker towards um, criminal behaviour, then, then in fact uh, we, will, we will work move quickly here as they will nationally um, to, to actually outlaw them. But in, at this stage, I think in fact, um, even though um, without actually good evidence, it, it might be quite hard to ban, ban a product, which is essentially this is, it's a commercial product. It would be hard to ban a product on the basis of, an, un, you know, on, on allegations or uh, unsupported um, um, con conclusions that this is a dangerous thing without any evidence. So we need some evidence. If the evidence points in, in the way that this suggests is that this is actually dangerous or actually leads or promotes or encourages or is a stepping stone towards offending, then, then we've got, we can act accordingly. Yeah, it's straight. I would worry about this and I think it is a growing area of concern and knowing the nature of that criminality and the people involved, I think it, it would be a marker and an indicator and then if you have some sort of uh, offence or uh, uh, conviction around that, then it could lead to better detection and management uh, going forward. So I, I do think there's a, a piece of work there needs to be done. You, oh, my final point is on your the issue with regards to your capacity as a team, and I get that. I've, I've been a man manager all my life, and there's only a certain amount of man hours in any given team. So I get that, but sooner or later you're going to bump into a thing called the legislative assembly, and and then anything can happen on the floor. So Again, just on that, some of these issues will be important to members, not least this committee. Uh, so, you know, I suppose if we need more resource, we need more resource. We need more capacity, we need more capacity. And uh, I think we'd be very interested in having a conversation with the Minister if that was the case. I think <coughs> the, the truth is, um, well, on the Papani point, um, I, I'll... I'll I'll quiz my colleagues about that, about the Papani dust, uh, and sex doll to see whether there's any evidence at all that this is an issue or even actually has been sort of noted. Um, on the use of resource, clearly um, uh, you'll always tell, uh, civil servants are always told we have, there are too many, too, we have too many, too much resource and actually what we're doing. The reality is, you know, we, I have 20 staff in my division and we're covering uh, a very, very wide range of criminal justice policy and legislation. We're both actually developing policy and um, managing bills and um, um, doing research into new areas. Um, and that, that we, perhaps because the assembly actually had a period where it wasn't active, uh, when it's come in, I have to say, you, you and your colleagues have been uh, slightly overactive insofar as we, we are finding we are a large number of things coming in at the same time. Um, the truth is we are never resourced to do all everything we can do at the same time. So we're always going to have to put them into some sort of order. And then it clearly take, we take our, our, our advice uh, as to the order from our minister, of course, and then the, the committee itself will have its own views, which we will, of course, take into account. Uh, but the reality is actually there has been a number of things coming, to, to a, coming out at the same time. Um, and naturally, we, are, we obviously want to do as good a job as we can. That means I, know, I can't just divide my resources uh, into, into salami slicing. I have to actually get them to do one thing before and next. So, so you know, resource-wise, I'm no worse off than anyone else in the department. I've got a very good team. We do, I think they do exceptionally good work. But at the same time, clearly things, things happen. Uh, when things happen, you know, that diverts my resources. If the committee um, bring or the assembly bring issues up during the course of a passage of a bill, 
that would create more work. That may mean I have to reprioritize some things. That's always a possibility. But at the end of the day, what my job is to make sure we give the minister and the, the assembly and the committee what it wants by way of legislation and policy. And, I, and, and I that, that's always a challenge. And I get that. I've been a man manager all my life, so I, I do have sympathies for you there. And the, the legislative assembly is here to help. Well, there we go. So anyway, I, and I, don't, I didn't, don't see you as a burden or an obstacle. I think that there are opportunities for us to work constructively and collaboratively to, do, to produce good law. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Brian. And we know Paul's a man manager now. So, <laughs> but uh, I think that's all the members that have the raised, that have raised uh, questions. Um, obviously, we're, we're going to want to engage in this. Um, but there has been very good work done, Brian. Uh, obviously, members will, will focus in on areas that haven't progressed, maybe that they would like to see progress, but in terms of uh, areas that are going to be included in the miscellaneous provisions bill that you've outlined, I very much welcome all of that, and uh, that, that is the result of good work. I also accept the department is under uh, different obligations um, in terms of the need for public consultation and stakeholder engagement, and that has to be carried out whenever you're dealing with uh, very sensitive policy areas that need to go into law. MLAs, when it comes to consideration stage, um, aren't under the same uh, legal duty in that respect, and hence amendments then come forward. Um, so I, I do think in preparation for the miscellaneous bill, and it's a, a point that I'll make um, to the Minister, I have no doubt that there's going to be amendments coming on a very wide range of issues, and that's going to require the Department to be able to respond to all of that. Um, and so I don't underestimate the challenge that that's going to pose to the Department, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, it only takes the course of the domestic abuse bill for the department to recognise that members will pursue amendments and the committee will pursue amendments, even at times when the department doesn't want that to happen, and we'll very effectively get that put through the assembly as we've done. So that's more um, in preparation. I do think there's going to be a significant amount of work in the miscellaneous provisions bill, and uh, probably preparing for that is as a precautionary approach that would be worth taking on board by the department, but I'm going to make that point more generally to, to the minister, but you're obviously very important, Brian, in terms of how officials respond to this. So, um, on that, I'll say well, thank I'm, I'm not sure it might be important, but in fact, our, our job is to actually produce legislation and to produce good legislation. So, the, 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 clearly, the Assembly members have the capacity to put in their amendments. We will actually deal with those as they arrive in the best way we can. And if it means I have to divert a big proportion of my, my resources to doing that, it means other things will go more slowly, but that's, but that's life. So in fact, you know, our, job, our job is to deliver against these things. So in fact, um, our priorities and, and timings will, will vary appropriately. Okay. Lovely. Thank you, Brian, and, and your team for spending the time with us this afternoon. Um, uh, I'll pleasure. Uh, many thanks. All right, thank you. Um, to, just to, to finish up that exercise then, if members are happy, you will write to the Education Minister, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong in here on this one, what role has the Department in advising young people of the law on the age of consent in respect of sexual relations, and how does the Department go about discharging its responsibility, should it have one in this area, by way of outlining the processes? And if members are happy, we'll ask the same question to the uh, Department for Justice with the further point to that as to how it engages with all the relevant stakeholders in ensuring legislation is disseminated to the appropriate people that it affects in this area as well. Okay. Um, any other business? No other business. Well, then, um, we shall adjourn and reconvene next week, I think, in the Senate chamber. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.